We gave the world knowledge, excellence, and creativity with great scientists and artists that were ahead of their times. From the past, we build the present. The fastest learning network of science, technology parks, startup centers, and smart city centers. We are establishing the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in partnership with the World Economic Forum for development, testing, and enhancing new technologies for the benefit of society. Today, we are ready to go beyond and embrace the potential of biotechnology by gathering academia, businesses, and research and development centers in Bio4 campus. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Serbia and First Biotech Future Forum. Wow, I must say that. This is an uh, impressive contribution of Serbia scientists to the world. We are sure that Serbia's innovators will continue to transform the world and create solutions to ensure progress for people and economies while safeguarding the planet. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished guests and friends from Serbia, the region, wider Europe and the world. I'm honored to guide you today through the program of this highly important and timely conference on biotechnology for the first time organized in Serbia. We hope that this conference, Biotech Future Forum, will help strengthen cooperation between you, our dear guests, who will help straighten cooperation uh, and uh, represent forward-thinking businesses, governments, and uh, academia. Only together we can share knowledge and practices in this field and better shape the development and numerous applications of biotechnology, including in medicine and healthcare, environmental protection, and food production. Now, on the very beginning, I have a great pleasure and honor to announce someone who has been a long-time champion of new technologies and always recognized the importance of investing in a knowledge-based economy, creativity and innovation. Respected Prime Minister, Ms. Anna Brnabic, please take the stage. Thank you very much, dear guests, dear Borge, friends, partners from the World Economic Forum, friends and partners from United Arab Emirates, Turkey, Rwanda, and many other places. We have representatives from as much as 20 countries here with us in Belgrade and Serbia on this occasion. Uh, dear partners from uh, UNDP, um, members of my own team who were behind this, as well as our effort to work with the World Economic Forum to establish one of their centers 
the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution of the World Economic Forum here in Belgrade. Um, and for easier reference, just to, just to see how much we care about all of you, all of the women who are dealing with biotech in Serbia are called Jelena, for your easier reference so you don't make any mistakes. So both of you. That is how detail-oriented we are. I would like to welcome you again to Serbia and thank you for being here with us today for what I hope is the beginning of a very long and fruitful journey uh, for us to be established and recognized as one of the biotech, biomedicine and bioinformatics center of excellence in Europe. Serbia has done so much in the past six to seven years to change its fate, to change, for us to change ourselves in order to become economy and country and a society which is based primarily on innovation, knowledge and new technologies. We saw that that is a true opportunity for us, living at the time of fourth industrial revolution, to use our strengths um, and make up for all of the lost time in the 90s and early part of 2000s. We were not afraid to dream big. We introduced many changes from introducing coding and programming as mandatory subjects in our primary schools, to introducing a completely new, brand new subject, digital world, in primary schools, introducing the basis of AI in our primary schools, increasing the number of specialized IT classes in our secondary schools, and increasing the capacity of our tech faculties to enroll and educate more students. We have built in the past six years as much as four science and technology parks across Serbia. One is here in Belgrade, one is up north in Novi Sad, one is in western central Serbia, Čačak, and one is in southern Serbia, Niš. And we have also built a whole network of business incubators and startup centers across Serbia. We have introduced a significant tax incentives for the companies and investors they want, that want to come and invest in research and development here in Serbia and create intellectual property in Serbia. We have introduced special tax incentives for companies that are employing our people from abroad, our people from diaspora, and bringing, bringing them back to Serbia to create added value. We have introduced special tax incentives for foreigners to come and work in Serbia. And we have really tried very, very hard to, to establish an ecosystem which would enable a fast growth and changes to our economy. Last year, we have established a brand new institute for AI. We were only the 26th country in the world and first country in this part of Europe to adopt the strategy on AI. And today we have more than 30 experts working in AI Institute. Majority of those experts are Serbians who came back from abroad, from the United States, Canada, Switzerland, Italy, many other countries, Germany, who have spent more than 20 years living and working abroad. They came back because they saw that there are changes that are taking place in Serbia and they wanted to be part of that change. And the results are amazing. In the past 10 years, Serbia has changed almost completely. Six years ago, agriculture was our strongest economic sector. Today, IT is by far the strongest sector. 
It is our sector with the biggest exports, sector which employs, creates most of new jobs and creates most of new opportunities in Serbia. Ten years ago, the export of our IT was 370 million euros. So for the entire 2012, it was 370 million euros. This year, in 2022, it will be over 2.5 billion euros. That is how change can affect your development if you're really dedicated to it. Last year, in 2021, every second new job created in Serbia was in the IT sector. We have strong institutes, such as, for example, Biosense Institute, and some of you will go to Novi Sad and visit Biosense Institute, which has been established as the European Center of Excellence in Digital Agriculture. The logical next step for us is biotechnology, which is why the next government and the new government will soon be formed, I'm hoping, by the end of next week. The new government, the key focus of the new government will be biotechnology, biomedicine, bioinformatics, and biodiversity. We will invest more than 200 million euros into something that we call Bio4 Campus, and later in the day you will have a chance to see our Bio4 Campus. The campus that will encompass our faculties, research institutes, science and technology park, AI institute, and the place for private sector to grow, develop, and innovate here in Serbia. I said yesterday, I will, I will repeat it today. Our motto was somewhat easy and simple. For those of you who saw this American film, The Field, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. That is what we were driven by when we started building science and technology parks in Serbia. And today, all of them are full and we are already building new buildings to expand our science and technology parks. That is why we introduced changes in our education. Now, biotech is the logical next step. Some even call it the fifth industrial revolution. I can't say that in front of Borge Brande, the president of the World Economic Forum, because Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum actually came up with this fourth industrial revolution, so we can't claim to say that this is exactly the fifth industrial revolution, but the changes that it will bring to medicine, human kind, to population, the technology, the climate change, diversity, and all of that will have similar impact. And we want to be part of that. We know we can do it. We know and believe in the capacities of our people here in Serbia, our universities and our research institutes, and we wanted you to be part of that from the very beginning, hence today's conference. I would, at the end, like to thank you again for being here, and I hope that some of you will, after this conference, be interested in relocating to Serbia or perhaps thinking about opening research and development center in Serbia as so many companies are doing nowadays. But certainly, I would like to ask you to think about becoming our, the part of our Bio4 campus, because I truly believe this is going to be the future of biotechnology for this part of Europe, and we want to do it together. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next year in the second international biotech conference organized by the World Economic Forum and the government of Serbia when we would celebrate our new successes together. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you for this inspiring speech, Prime Minister Brnovic, and thank you for uh, sharing your perspective and the perspective of uh, the government of Serbia 
on the importance of the digital transformation, transformation and uh, new breakthroughs in life science for the lives of current and generations to come, our economies and our planet. Uh, the government of uh, Serbia has made great strides in uh, digitalization of the economy and society in the past uh, five years. A vision complemented with uh, strategic thinking and political uh, will already created an enabling environment uh, for innovation. We are uh, confident that uh, biotechnology will be the new frontier to open immense new opportunities for development. We are honored to have with us today the president of the World Economic Forum, uh, Forum Mr. Borge Brende. The government of Serbia partnered with the World Economic Forum to create the center for the fourth industrial revolution in Serbia that will be instrumental in bringing Serbia's biotech vision to life. Mr. Brende, the floor is yours. Dear Prime Minister, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really uh, delighted uh, to be here uh, today and uh, my real uh, sincere gratitude to Prime Minister Anna Branabic uh, for inviting me uh, to this important biotech forum. As already mentioned, uh, the World Economic Forum and the government of Serbia have a long-standing relationship as we deem Serbia and the region as important partners. The forum has a rich um, history of engagement with the Western Balkans, with a forward-looking uh, agenda that thrives on supporting economic and social growth. In this context, I would also like to thank my friend, uh, Alexander Vucic, the president of Serbia, for his continuous support also of the vision of a prosperous Western Balkan, but also a Serbia that's um, really at the forefront in the region when it comes to technologies. I will come back to that. Prime Minister um, Branabic uh, and I were together uh, in February at our headquarter uh, in Geneva, and uh, there we signed an agreement to establish this center for the fourth industrial revolution here in Belgrade, Serbia. Today's event also marks the launch, the official one, of the center in Serbia, and we are truly delighted to see Serbia as part of our global network. We now have 16 centers uh, around uh, the world, but uh, this center will also be a very, very special one now coming back to that. I'm deeply inspired um, by, as always, uh, the speech uh, of the Prime Minister and also on her leadership in the vision of fostering digital economy in Serbia. She mentioned that um, one out of two jobs uh, the last year has come in the technology center. And when we looked at the statistics last night, it seems like almost 10% of GDP in Serbia is no in the ICT sector. That shows if you have a vision, if you put the resources um, where your priorities are, it is possible to make a big progress. Serbia uh, is now taking um, strong leadership in driving and investing in uh, local and global transformation through these emerging technologies. And I think the launch of the fourth industrial um, center here in Serbia is um, quite a consequential one. And the new technologies are not going to play any uh, less part in uh, the global economy moving forward. Quite the contrary. But we also have to grasp how fast these changes are taking place. If you look at the 10 largest companies today, in the world, 
on market cap. Around five or six of them did not exist 20 years ago. That means that if this continues, five out of the 10 most valuable companies in 20 years are not even started yet. I think this is a reminder um, to everyone if you don't believe in change and you think things are very comfortable like uh, it is today, one has to remind itself, oneself that uh, prosperity is something that you have to fight for every day and the technologies will be an important part of that. All companies can face their Kodak moment. If you do remember Kodak, I asked my youngest son the other day if he had heard about Kodak, this company, and said, no, no, never. Uh, and I, 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 I think there are so many young people here so you might not have heard about it either. But um, anyway, uh, we all will have to face situations where you have to have a little bit of Schumpeter thinking, like creative destruction. You have to break some eggs to make omelet. Maybe that um, quote is a little bit too political these days, but anyway, um, it is um, what uh, it is. And look at another company that also had a big decision to make in this field, was Microsoft. When they decided to go in the cloud, it was not an easy discussion. It was tough discussions on the board if this was really the path forward. And uh, it showed uh, to be the right step. And here, I think also Serbia is now taking the right steps to implement um, technology, to be a hub for technology, to have this center. And just imagine 10 years ago, if you said that Serbia would then not anymore have agriculture as its most important exports, uh, export article, but it would be in the ICT sector, maybe some people would not have believed this. So I strongly, strongly believe that this vision is also creating more prosperity. And things are changing very fast. If we in this room 10 years ago said that the price of solar panels would fall to one-tenth, I think many would say, oh, that guy is probably a bit optimistic. But today, most places in the world, solar is competitive with all other energies, and you don't need to subsidize it anymore. In the beginning, it had to be subsidized. But now it is commercially available and it's a big deglobalization when it comes to energy. If you have wind and solar in your own country, everything is coming from your country and you don't rely on others. And I think that's maybe not a bad thing uh, in this world when it comes to energy. So within the network that we are building, uh, the Centers for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Serbia is the first center to lead on biotechnology and bioinformatics among the 16 centers that compromise the global network that I mentioned. As such, the center plays a crucial role in not only building out Serbia's um, biotech ecosystem, but leading across the global network uh, on policies, programs, and systems required to cultivate responsible biotechnology advancements and opportunities. The advancement of such work will already uh, see across panels and discussions today. I looked at the program. Uh, I'm impressed uh, also by all the knowledge in this room. So that's why I'm smart enough to not elaborate any further on the importance of the biotechnology. I stick to the areas that uh, I uh, know uh, by heart, but I do know that uh, what we're gonna see in the biotechnology area, bioengineering area, is the same kind of revolutions that we saw when it came to chemicals after the Second World War. It, we have only seen the tip 
of the iceberg. So congratulations on the um, formal inauguration of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And uh, thank you also uh, to the minister from UAE that is here, where we also have another center uh, in Dubai. Also, thank you uh, to the Turkish representative, where we also have a center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, in uh, Turkey. Great to see you all, and not at least, big thanks uh, to the Prime Minister and her visionary leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Brenda. I must say we are very proud to be the part of the network of 16 global centers of the World Economic Forum and the first in the region of the Western Balkans. We are sure that the expertise and value the network brings will help us avoid the pitfalls and contribute to achieve our goals much faster. Translating the potential of biotechnology into a success story is possible only if you have, on uh, your side, trusted partners who share your vision. We are grateful that the United Nations Development Program has been supporting the government's ambitious and comprehensive dig digital ag agenda, including uh, the formation of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now hear the message of the administrator of the United Nations Development Program, Mr. Akim Steiner. Prime Minister of Serbia, Anna Bernabic, President of the World Economic Forum, my dear friend and colleague, Borga Brende, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege to join the Biotech Future Forum. It takes place in the fitting location of Serbia, which is fast becoming a global technology hub. It is not only attracting some of the world's top companies and talent, it is also fostering the immense power of key areas like biotechnology, the intersection between technology and biology to create new solutions that can bring tangible benefits to the daily lives of people across the globe. Most notably, we are seeing how biotechnology was the basis for the messenger RNA vaccines, which have helped to save millions of lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the use of biotech could offer complete cures for some diseases. In many ways, new biological ways of making and processing materials, chemicals and energy will represent the future of development. They hold the potential to completely transform many industries, allowing the world to make vast inroads to tackle our immense challenges like food security or climate change. Indeed, this climate emergency is being acutely felt by countries such as Serbia, which has now endured its 13 hottest years on record since the year 2000. The challenge now is to set the conditions to allow the biotechnology industry to flourish in Serbia and the wider region. That includes the need to make it easier for biotech startups to operate and updating laws to catch up with the borderless world of biotech entrepreneurship. That's why our joint task is to help create adequate regulation and ensure that these new technologies are developed, tested and used for the benefit of all communities. This will be amongst the key objectives of the new Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in Belgrade, which will bring together scientists, government and industry representatives, and civil society. The United Nations Development Programme is proud to drive forward future smart development in partnership with Serbia, perhaps most notably through our Accelerator Lab. As part of the world's largest and fastest learning network on sustainable development challenges today, it is leveraging the power of grassroots innovators, digital technology, and data to drive solutions that can provide shortcuts and accelerators to the sustainable development goals. For instance, it is developing cutting-edge approaches to tackle the problem of depopulation in Serbia and using satellite data to map air pollution. Guided by a clear digital strategy, UNDP today is also supporting the government of Serbia to deploy a range of much-needed digital solutions. That includes everything from assisting persons with disabilities and older persons to acquire IT skills, to supporting the establishment of the AI Institute of Serbia. 
Prime Minister Bernovich, President of the World Economic Forum, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in many ways biotechnology will be a defining feature of the future of development. In this respect, the entire UN family and key partners like the World Economic Forum will continue to support communities across the region to push new boundaries. That involves fostering a culture of experimentation and innovation. In many ways, we are working to bring science, knowledge, technology and opportunity closer to those who can turn them into development choices and pathways. Together we are co-investing in the future to realize a greener, a more inclusive and a more sustainable world for all. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, to Mr. Steiner for this uh, video message and UNDP's uh, support. Biotechnology indeed has a tremendous potential to help us achieve multiple sustainable development goals. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Brende and Ms. Brnabic for contribution to the conference. They have to leave now, so let's give them one more time warm applause, please. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the first panel today, or the next panel, is exactly about the role of the leaders in stimulating the growth of uh, their countries by supporting cutting-edge initiatives and biotech development. We will hear their representatives and uh, experiences, which will help us shape the field's agenda for the coming years. I would like to invite our moderator, Ms. Marta Arsovska-Tomovska, advisor to the Prime Minister of Serbia, to join me on the floor, along with our distinguished panelists. Please, take your seat, Mr. Arsovska. First panelist is Mr. Branko Ružić, first Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Education, Science and Technological Development of Serbia. Please join us. Thank you. Yes. Please applause. Mr. Yves Iradukunda, Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of ICT and Innovation, Rwanda. Mr. Khalfan Juma Belul, CEO of Dubai Future Foundation, United Arab Emirates. And Mr. Fabio Scano, World Health Organization representative in Serbia. Hi, how are you? Thank you. And uh, before we begin, uh, let us hear a message from Mr. Omar Sultan Al Olama, Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence from the United Arab Emirates, who will give us an introduction to this panel and open the discussion. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute honor and privilege being with all of you here today. And I'm happy to accept the gracious invitation of the Republic of Serbia and the World Economic Forum to address you all in this very important forum, the Biotech Future Forum, focused on creating a positive future that ushers in positive change by leveraging the best practices and uses of biotechnology from around the world. The UAE and Serbia are two countries that believe in strategic dialogue, in partnership, and in creating a better future for both of their populations, governments, private sector, as well as everyone that interacts with both governments. We have many strategic partnerships and many strategic projects with Serbia that include government exchange and government improvements, that includes as well military training and military defense exercises, as well as student exchange. All of these initiatives and all of these programs aim to do one important thing, and that is sharing of knowledge, making sure that we are able to cross-fertilize when it comes to expertise, and also have a cooperation that spans across borders. The UAE has had a roadmap when it comes to biotechnology that has spanned multiple years. It included the establishment of the Dubai Science Park, which has been a model to um, create other biotech cities and science parks around the world, and also meet countries' uh, aspirations in that field as well. In the UAE, we believe that biotechnology needs to focus on improving quality of life, the lifespan, and the well-being of individuals. 
the role of every government in the world is to leverage these technologies and take them very seriously to create a better future starting from today. Some other initiatives that we have focused on in the UAE are uh, initiatives like the Khalifa Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, which was inaugurated in 2014. These centers, science parks, as well as different countrywide, whether it's local or federal uh, initiatives focusing on biotechnology, aim to make the UAE one of the most important countries in the region and the world, hopefully, in the sphere of biotechnology. The past three years have seen an incredible boom in venture capital funding, and especially in the biotech field. According to McKinsey, companies have invested, more than two th invested in more than 2,200 biotech startups in the world from 2016 to 2021. And that number in 2021 has reached 3,100 uh, startups. They've also found that biotech companies raised more than $34 billion globally, doubling the amount of $16 billion in 2020. In the UAE, we've worked and partnered with the World Economic Forum as well to launch one of the mandates of the Center for Industrial Revolution to focus on precision medicine. We believe that the future of precision medicine is going to be intertwined with biotechnology. And that is why this forum and the outcomes and deliberations of this forum is going to be key and paramount for us as well in the UAE in understanding what needs to happen and how we can improve the quality of life of citizens and individuals across the world. I wish you a successful event, successful deliberations, and hope to hear about the incredible impact that this event has had. Thank you very much and I wish you a wonderful day. So, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. After we were inspired by the Prime Minister Anna Bernavic, uh, by the President of the World Economic Forum, Mr. Bon uh, Berge Bonde, and of course, uh, after the UNDP, uh, uh, UNDP uh, representative, we would like to start this panel by a very inspirational opening, let's say, over here uh, from my dear colleague uh, and our friend from UAE, His Excellency Minister Al Lama. What was very important here, he practically summarized what is the importance of this topic in the three main uh, observations. First one would be that biotech represents a great uh, a way to improve our lives, the quality of our lives, the lifespan, and the well-being of our nation. Second one is, if I can summarize, is that it represents an enormous business opportunity for our countries. And the third one, that we should do it collectively and through a real collaboration we can uh, achieve our aspiration for a better future. So this panel is about leveraging synergies and partnerships so we all together build a solid biotech ecosystems. And we have three leaders here from three countries and we have also the World Health Organization as a global organization uh, on this panel, uh, we will discuss only the aspect of creating eco ecosystems and we are going to leave all the technical, all the scientific and the business aspects of, of this very important domain to our colleagues, uh, scientists, engineers, researchers and entrepreneurs that, that you will have the chance to see throughout the day. So I will ask now uh, Minister Ruzic, just as he is a host of this event as, as, event as well, just to briefly welcome uh, our guests, and then we will both be perfect hosts and start with a question with our friends from abroad. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marta. I could agree more that we, we will both be good hosts. Well, we, we are very happy and proud to have Belgrade as, as the host city of the Biotech uh, Future Forum. 
Of course, I'm positive that we will have uh, really uh, fruitful discussions. Hopefully, uh, as, a, as a Serbian uh, and, and a citizen of Belgrade, uh, I hope that you will leave Belgrade with, with uh, new ideas uh, after the exchange of, uh, of the views and, and all the things that will happen during the day and with many, many new friends. And of course, we hope that you will be coming back very soon. Thank you very much. And I will start with uh, Your Excellency Belho. Uh, you're coming from Dubai. So if there is any organization in the world, I would say that is best place to envision the future, that would be the Dubai Future Foundation. It was envisioned not to, best, uh, to make Dubai the best city for the future, but to do it collectively and to establish a global platform from, for future foresight. So uh, could you tell us more about the foundation, how it was conceived, and maybe what are the most important projects that you are the most proud of? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you, Marta. But if you allow me, first of all, uh, Prime Minister Bernabic and our dear friend, uh, President of the World Economic Forum, uh, Borge Brende, uh, Your Excellencies, dear friends, we're honored and thank you so much for having us here in this um, amazing event. And before I start talking about the Dubai Future Foundation, I'd like to appreciate the efforts that have been happening here, uh, led by the Prime Minister, and the quantum uh, shift in the economy contributors that has happened upon this leadership. We relate to this in the United Arab Emirates because we are also a small country, but we also have massive ambitions. So we been through this journey and we relate and appreciate the efforts that have been happening here and definitely see so much value in, in collaborating and I'll come to the collaboration point because I also want to send a message of appreciation to the president of the World Economic Forum um, and the launch of the center because we constantly say that uh, and going back to not even scratching the surface or the tip of the iceberg in the sense of the potential that those centers can achieve. Yes, these centers are focusing on specific uh, reports and efforts, but we also had a discussion, Marta, yesterday over dinner with the Prime Minister and the dear guests that the dialogues should be cross-border, they should be cross-linked, and they should not only be driven by the reports that impact one country, and that's why I say that the Center of Fourth Industrial Revolution can be a significant tool going forward if we were really to align as a globe, not as dedicated centers, and we can really leverage on that tool to ensure there's global harmonization when it comes to any challenges or any solutions we want to achieve, which are all global. Now, going back to your point, uh, Marta, the Dubai Future Foundation is a simple example of how uh, the country thinks. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President of UAE, uh, ruler of Dubai, uh, he uh, wanted to institutionalize the future foresight thinking. And it really happened in a convening in the United Arab Emirates. For those of you who know it, President Borge definitely knows it, the World Government Summit, which is, uh, to, to the words of uh, Professor Klaus Schaub, is a little brother to the World Economic Forum. And uh, in that convening, uh, there were so many future relevant dialogues happening around six years ago. And there was a small immersive experience talking about the future challenges. And when I say small, it's probably a quarter the size of this room. And the delegates of, the, uh, of that uh, event, out of which ministers, CEOs, prime ministers were there, and His Highness only saw the level of discussion um, on the future relevant matters and the solutions that need to be made. So the message was, we need to institutionalize the foresight thinking. We need to think of a way how we can really plan for the future in a better way for humanity as a whole. So he announced the formation of an entity to focus and do that. And that's the beauty of our leaders. They come up with a seed of a vision, and then we have to figure out how it works. And, 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 and we were delegated the responsibility to come up with a plan. But the summary is we are a think tank that works for a better future for everyone, starting from Dubai, and we are also a lab that tests new ideas, agnostically across all sectors. And when you do that, it means that you need to really collaborate and work with every sector and every region, because the pain points are global, 
the cross-border situations are global, the data protection rights and the data challenges are global, the metaverse is definitely global and virtual, and how can we really figure that out? So I think the center can be a tool, and the Dubai Future Foundation is a mechanism in Dubai to think on how to do that and execute strategies on an agnostic basis. Thank you very much. I'll come to Mr. Iradkunda coming from Rwanda, which is one of the most developed uh, African economies in the sense on innovation. And I would, it's also the center for the fourth industrial, uh, the, the home to the one of the centers of the fourth industrial revolution. I would like to ask you, why is the topic of innovation important for Rwandian government and especially why the biotech innovation? Oh, thank you very much. And first of all, I wanted to express our gratitude for uh, including us in this, this very important uh, conversation that is, I believe, very timely. And uh, we already inspired by the remarks by the Prime Minister uh, and the vision that Serbia has to really lead uh, the forefront of biotech and transformation. So as a Rwanda, as a country, uh, we, we are uh, really on the similar pathway in terms of embracing technology and digital transformation in everything that we do. And this conversation becomes even more important as we recover from the COVID-19, which has highlighted uh, uh, dif different gaps when it comes to creating our homegrown solutions uh, to challenges such as the pandemic and others that we can anticipate. So when we look at biotech as a topic, uh, both from a perspective of uh, healthcare and agriculture, uh, there are several uh, uh, opportunities that we have uh, to create our own solution. When you think about healthcare, for instance, uh, we know Rwanda sits right at the heart of uh, uh, the, tropi the, tropic, uh, uh, the tropics, and we deal with some of the uh, neglected uh, tropical diseases that lack enough research, uh, deep research, to really understand how do we deal with uh, these, these uh, diseases. And this could be, as well, the source for the next pandemic. So it's very important that we are investing in the right research, innovation, but also particularly we're focusing on the realities of the region. When you look at agriculture uh, uh, also, you know, Rwanda, you know, I was pleased to see similarities with uh, Serbia. Uh, we are nicknamed the uh, land of a thousand hills. And also we happen to be uh, the densest uh, country on the mainland uh, Africa. What does that mean for agriculture? Uh, one, it's really hard to achieve extensive farming. Um, and yet we have majority of the population practice agriculture uh, to date. And so we need innovative approaches towards uh, agriculture uh, because we cannot uh, uh, have an extensive uh, farming. And so the innovations around uh, biotechnology will have significant um, uh, impact on how we respond to the healthcare challenges, but also uh, achieving uh, resilience when it comes to food production. And lastly, it's on climate responsiveness. And I think as a dense population, we need to deal with uh, challenges like transport and, and other, other issues um, to respond to the needs of the environment. So I think really pleased to be here. Um, and I think, Your Excellency, you pointed out the fact that uh, this is an ecosystem. And through our Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, uh, we are already seeing a lot of opportunities to collaborate uh, with Serbia as well as uh, other centers that are already established. So we are very pleased to be a part of this landmark conversation. Thank you very much for that. And Minister Ružić, we have heard to uh, Prime Minister Sana Brnabić vision to leverage on the biotech to build an even stronger knowledge-based nation. But what do you think? Are we ready for that ambitious plan? Do, you, do we have capacities for that? Well, when, when you hear from the Prime Minister, then you have to be ambitious and, and the plan has to be realistic. Well, of course, the, the government of uh, the Republic of Serbia and the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development have already made some significant steps uh, towards uh, the reform of, of science and research system uh, aimed at improving the, the relevance and excellence for, for the economic uh, development. And uh, the milestones are, of course, the, the legal framework because we had, we had to change some laws and uh, we had a law on science and research that was adopted in 
2019, Law & Science Fund uh, in December 2018, and uh, these were the key steps for uh, the reform of the system of organization and financing of science, ensuring the conditions uh, for a continuous development uh, that will be uh, uh, economic-wise uh, uh, sufficient for, for Serbia. Uh, of course, uh, this reform is followed uh, by increased investment uh, in research activities throughout the years. And, uh, for example, in the period from 2015 to 2019, uh, the investment was increased by 35.8%. Uh, and with, with these uh, legal framework changes, of course, and the investment climate in Serbia, thanks to the political leadership of, of our president, I think that we, we are making this, this uh, great progress. Uh, and in the previous period, the government of the Republic of Serbia uh, also adopted a number of strategic uh, documents. Uh, so the strategy, uh, the power of knowledge from 2020 to 2025, uh, smart specialization strategy, tra strategy for the development of the startup ecosystems uh, in the Republic of Serbia from year 2021 to 2025. Uh, also, uh, we provided funds for scientific research, thanks to the laws that, we, that were adopted, uh, the Science Fund and the Innovation Fund, which ensure financing and developing uh, different programs to support the best quality scientists, best quality ideas. Uh, also, uh, if we look at the numbers, uh, the Science Fund and the previously uh, established Innovation Fund uh, that provide financial support, as I said, uh, the, the Science Fund uh, financed two, 282 projects and nearly 1,800 scientists with a budget of, of 44 million euros. And ab among these projects, there are 12 research groups in the development of artificial intelligence and robotics. Also, the Innovation Fund finances, uh, financed nearly one 1,500 projects with a budget of 54 million euros. Uh, also, concerning the network of, or, of faculties and institutes, it's really a, a, a wide network, uh, 123 faculties, 65 institutes uh, that are accredited for scientific research activities, uh, of which eight institutes are of national importance. Uh, and uh, in addition to, to the existing network of scientific research organizations, the state of Serbia is, is also establishing new institutes, and in the previous period, a number of new institutions uh, were uh, uh, established. The, one of the strong uh, focuses, and when I see Mr. Baja here, I have to mention that not only the artificial intelligence, but the fourth, fourth industrial uh, revolution is, of course, artificial intelligence. And we are proud to share that we are the first country in Southeast Europe and the 26th in the world uh, to adopt an uh, artificial intelligence strategy uh, back in 2019. Um, last year, we established the Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And if I go on like that, you will fall asleep. But this is uh, for sure uh, a good precondition to, to actually uh, give the, the base for, for this uh, ambitious plan that was promoted by, by our Prime Minister. Thank you, Minister. So governments are doing many interesting things, but I, I'm, I'm curious to ask uh, Mr. Scano, how can one uh, global organization such as the World Health Organization help to increase the innovation capacity, especially in the domain of uh, biotech and, and healthcare? And if there are some it, initiatives that the World Health Organization already undertook that can literally shape the future of our healthcare? Marta, thank you for the question and let me take it from two angles. Uh, the first angle uh, which the World Health Organization supports and promotes uh, biotech and innovation is to its normative function. Basically is to develop guidance for the researchers, the academia and the government on uh, what are the standards. I won't go through it because you can find it online and uh, as Minister was referring earlier, it will be pretty boring to just list uh, the, the, the names and, uh, of uh, the guidance. 
The other one that is very concrete and that I would like to highlight uh, the importance of is strengthening the regulator. We haven't talked so much about it, but the regulator is a crucial aspect of having a healthy innovation in a country. How do we do that? Well, first of all, uh, uh, strengthening the regulator means that the regulator is up to speed with the innovation that is happening, that is able to uh, regulate, that generally has a negative connotation, but actually shouldn't be seen like that, that is able to make sure that what comes to the market is of quality, is it safe. He also beats trust between the citizen and the government and the industry. So uh, the way that we do this is through the benchmarking process. We did this in 2018 in uh, Serbia, and this is a concrete thing that we do. It basically is that they assess uh, the regulator for the production of a vaccine uh, together also with the uh, MOH uh, to ensure that what comes from Serbia is of quality. And the biotech component is included in it. This is not just a one-off exercise. A team is coming next week from Geneva to start the reassessment of the regulator for vaccine. But we don't stop there. We are also starting an engagement with Serbia to do the benchmarking for medicine, for blood and blood products. And as part of this benchmarking, all the aspects of innovation are there. This is not just a one-month endeavor. It, is, it, is, it takes years because there are no shortcuts to quality. And that is the continuous engagement we like to engage with. The second initiative that is very linked to this one is the transfer of messenger RNA technology. And uh, Serbia was uh, selected first because they applied, but it was entrusted by WHO because you were benchmarked for the vaccine, because we knew that there was a quality in Serbia. And you were one of the few countries in the European region that spans from Madeira to Vladivostok and counts 53 countries that was in that position. So, but it's not only just one place that it will be TOLAC, it's also to engage with other company, that is Ravia, and as a matter of fact, next week they are flying to Seoul to the WHO hub for biotechnology. Uh, so that when we come back, we can have a concrete discussion in uh, December, also with the Geneva colleagues, on the way forward that we want to go. And this is hand in hand with strengthening the regulator. So I was captivated when I entered the room by this shape that it's uh, on, on the screen, that is the dots. To me, innovation is about bringing the dots together into a shape. And it's not just a business, a government, and academia. It's know-how, it's creativity, it's the regulator. That shape has to be strong. And uh, it doesn't have just to float. Now the image is frozen, but if you saw before it was floating, that shape has to fly, because that is the aspiration of Serbia for the future. And that was also very putly nice by Prime Minister Nabic. OK, what is the role of the regulator there? If that dot is not there, the shape can be strong, but it will lose up because at a certain point, there will be loopholes in the system. So that's why really we have to go hand in hand, strengthening the capacity of the regulator, but also promoting innovation ultimately for the economy, but also for the people of Serbia because you have to serve at the end the people. Thank you very much. So when, when you talk about going hand in hand, I'm very curious about um, Dubai Future Forum. That's another initiative that you enacted uh, soon, and I believe last week you yeah. have the Dubai Future Forum held in Dubai, where you gathered a number of futurists and people that are thinking how can they improve basically our future in one single space. I just want to, 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 to know if there were any topics that you discussed or maybe some conclusions uh, that you drawn that, are, uh, that were related to, to biotech, be it uh, healthcare or industrial or agricultural. Yeah, I mean, first of all, yes. Uh, and please allow me, first of all, Marta, to thank you. I apologize, I didn't thank you in my opening remarks, but you are the catalyst of the relationship, so we really appreciate your effort and, and what you have done to, to, to bridge the, the relationship, so thank you for that. Uh, the Dubai Future Forum for us is a, 
It is our annual convening simply of like-minded people when we think about the future. I think we all agree that the future needs us all to collaborate in, on every front. So for us, this convening will only get bigger and bigger uh, every year. This was the inaugural event. We had more than 400 futurists from all over the world. And the idea, to your point, Marta, is to come up with dialogues, discussions about how can we create a better future. And the dialogues, again, were very agnostic to, to, to all the usual suspects of challenges that we face globally, whether it be climate change, adaptation with the robotics and, and AI, cryptocurrency, biotech, uh, the metaverse. And I think those, um, the, the, the biggest discussion uh, or the biggest conclusion is, um, to your point, um, the advancement of technology is way too fast. Um, we need agile governments. We need governments to really adapt the role of governments going forward. Governments should convert into enablers and platforms. The private sector has data that's more valuable than any government currently. How can we leverage on that relationship? How can we create this most agile mechanism of amending regulation in favor of innovation? Even though it sounds uh, easier said than done, um, th no matter how much we amend regulation, innovation just changes way too fast. And we know that, and we came to a conclusion that this will always be happen. But at the same time, you need governments that listen and try to adapt and create mechanisms that help ideas shoot. But again, to your point, sir, is, is, is safety is extremely important. Creating those POC sandboxes processes where all those uh, 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 ideas, especially the biotech ideas that are health and safety related, where they are tested and, uh, and, and uh, executed in a very well-managed manner, but in a fast way as well, because uh, uh, advanced technology uh, is, is simply advanced, uh, advancing fast. Obviously, uh, in biotech, there are so many uh, discussions that have been taking place on, on how fast uh, the medical sector will transform into the metaverse, how easy will it be uh, uh, capitalized through a virtual world, the connection between doctors all over the world, the, the, the procedures that can be done, let alone the connection between the biotech solution and neuroscience as well. And when, when advancement of technology goes to that level where uh, the brain connectivity is also involved in the biotech solution, going back again to us not even scratching the surface with the capabilities of, of, of quantum computing. So, so if you merge all those things together, you feel the sky's the limit on where you can reach. But the key role of governments, like I said, is to create that platform to thrive. How do you do that? Agile and fast, safe at the same time, connection of uh, academia to the private sector, to the venture capitalists. The government also needs to play a VC role. The VC role of government slightly differs when it comes to it driving an impact venture capital fund. And when I say impact, and we have this through our Dubai Future District Fund, where it plays a double bottom line strategy. Yes, we look at multiples and IRRs and exits, but we focus on deep technology. We focus on biotech. We look at, we are not as much interested. Um, our LPs are government, which means our investment horizons can go longer, which means we can have more patient capital. But we can, this also means we can create new sectors, i.e. new biotech solutions that we can wait for to thrive. So there is investment from the government and private sector. There's academia involved. There's the, um, like I said, uh, agile government. And then how can you really harmonize all the, those in a, in a fast uh, manner? So that's, in, in summary, the conclusion. It's maybe easier said than done. But in order for it to, to happen, we all 100% agreed that the forum needs to continue, the dialogue needs to continue with uh, combined and collaborative efforts to come up with those solutions. Thank you very much, but, uh, Mr. Irad. Kunda, do you agree with that? What, what, what do you think will be the role uh, of the Rwandian government mm -hmm. to boost the biotech ecosystem in, in, in Rwanda? No, th thank you very much, and I couldn't agree more <laughs> on uh, creating a conducive environment, and government has to play an important role. And in our case, uh, with this uh, movement towards digital economy, digital transformation, we've had to take a step back and actually 
check whether the basics were there to enable uh, innovation to take place. And so uh, from a, a regulatory uh, and, and legal framework, we've had to make a lot of adjustments and create new laws and regulations that would, would enable us to uh, innovate, and particularly to attract the right uh, investments, the right talent that can be willing to come and do proof of concept uh, projects that can scale regionally and globally. Maybe just to give examples, we've had to look at um, data privacy and protection law because a lot of innovation that we are talking about has to do with accessing data sets that can enable uh, different models. And so we've put in place uh, the, the data protection and privacy law, and we are busy creating guidelines and, and frameworks, uh, particularly uh, ethical uh, guidelines, uh, uh, to make sure that um, AI and other emerging technologies can fuel innovation. And that goes with uh, a lot of capacity building, both within government, but also uh, working with the regulators so that the private sector, that the telecommunication, the banking, uh, and other institutions, including academia, can be able to have frameworks. And, and so, as another example, the Minister of Health uh, has put in place uh, you know, framework for data sharing and governance to make sure that this information can be available uh, to fuel innovation. The second thing that I think is important for the governments to do to create a conducive environment is to bridge the gaps between the private sector and academia uh, towards the priorities of the government. In our case, uh, we've had uh, some success. Um, I'll give a couple examples. Uh, a few years ago, there was a company uh, from the US called Zipline uh, that was testing use cases on using drones. And um, we were very interested in that. Uh, we invited them to come to Rwanda, and we worked with them with the use cases of delivering a blood. Um, I talked a bit about the typology of Rwanda, many hills, uh, difficult load networks uh, that are constantly improving. But um, at the time, there was a lot of uh, in, uh, lack of access to this you know, life-saving uh, uh, medical product, if you will. And um, we worked with uh, Zipline, not just on the technology in terms of avail availing the, the, the right uh, talent for training and investing in infrastructure, but most importantly, uh, all our regulators, the Civil uh, Aviation Authority and, and other regulators to make sure that the use case would be able to succeed. And uh, five years later, what you see now is a global company that is doing the same uh, in countries like Ghana, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and also back to the US where they, they had come from, uh, where the regulation had not made that possible for them. And so now, fast forward, it's not just actually delivery of uh, blood. Um, it has cut down more than 30% of wasted uh, uh, blood, um, but also has made it possible to have immediate access uh, for the, to this product. But more than that, it, it actually allowing uh, the bed for innovation. We're seeing the drone industry are growing in Rwanda for multiple other use cases in agriculture, in urbanization, in road network and maintenance, and, and other use cases. So that's just an example of where if government can be responsive and agile, to borrow your words, uh, and towards innovation, this can be uh, a possibility. Another example I would provide here is um, our Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, is busy working with uh, the Novartis Foundation uh, the, which has set up a health tech hub in Rwanda uh, uh, through uh, a, a tech hub, one of the largest in East Africa, uh, with the Norsken uh, uh, Foundation from Sweden. The health tech hub has brought a first cohort of uh, health tech companies from, uh, from um, across the continent. We have about 30 young companies that are, that are working on health uh, technology. And um, I'm glad that our representative for the Center of Industrial Evolution is here. Uh, without the ability for the center to bridge you know, between the legal framework, the regulatory challenges, these startups that are coming from all over the continent will not be able to engage with governments and access some of the data sets they need to design uh, different innovations. And so our ministry works very closely with the center. And I'm glad you pointed out the need to really uh, work within an ecosystem where we can you know, access some of this cross-border data and challenges because these innovations are not just solving problems in Rwanda. They are looking at the continent and wanting to scale globally. And so I really believe that governments have an important role to play 
and I hope that we can learn a lot from the vision for CELPIA, but also able to share some, some of the, 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 what we are learning uh, within our process. Could not agree more. So governments are really responsible to kind of build of that ecosystem. But the ecosystems, they, they work as puzzle. They are, they are not complete if all parts are not there. So I would like to ask Minister Ružić, um, what is it in our ecosystem that we're doing to uh, improve it and to enable the environment for the entrepreneurs, for the businesses, so the biotech industry can thrive? Well, of course, governments are there to actually solve the puzzle. <laughs> that is their job. Well, of course, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, there are uh, numerous uh, strategies, uh, action plans, uh, programs, but we have to give them uh, the substance, and the substance is the support that uh, uh, the domestic innovative and um, uh, companies and startups uh, already get and, and have here in Serbia. And, of course, we are very well aware that all the systems are, uh, of course, connected. Uh, so we did, as I mentioned, uh, adopt the strategy uh, on ecosystems until 2025. Uh, and uh, as a result of that and, and the government's approach, uh, Startup Genome recognized Belgrade and Novi Sad as the top 10 globally emerging uh, uh, ecosystems. So this synergy is, uh, uh, of course, uh, functioning. Uh, and an increasing number of companies that are already in Serbia are more moving their initial teams to Serbia. And uh, while the, the startups from uh, artificial intelligence and robotics uh, up until now attracted up to 10 million uh, euros of investments uh, in, the, in the previous year, and uh, over 30% of startups in Serbia use uh, a, uh, AI as their uh, main technology. And we expect that in, in a few years, this significant growth of these uh, startups in Serbia will, of course, continue. Uh, medtech, biotech, uh, agritech are among the, the, the most, most promising do domains regarding technological innovation in Serbia. Uh, our prime minister uh, mentioned that we have four uh, science and technology parks now uh, start, we started the practice of um, appointing the uh, officers for technology transfer under each uh, uh, university in Serbia. And finally, the, the thing that is the most uh, important, as, as our Prime Minister announced, the Bio4 campus is under preparation. It will be, bring together five faculties, uh, nine scientific uh, institutes. Um, it, it will be an extension of the science and technology park for biotechnology startups and uh, a business park for research and development departments of domestic and global pharmaceutical, med medical and uh, biotechnological um, companies uh, in one place. And this is really a huge uh, visionary project uh, and it will, of course, uh, change the architecture of, of uh, this ecosystem in, in uh, Serbia, of our country. Uh, it will improve science and education, but also strengthen uh, the economy. And uh, uh, it will be the center of Serbia's economic development in the not only years, but I'm sure the decades to come. And later today, if I'm not mistaken, our colleagues will present this fantastic project. So I, I could invite you all to, to this presentation. It will be at 3.30, yeah, 30, I think. 30. Yes. Thank you very much. So, have one final question for, for all of you. Uh, today we talked a lot about the future, but if we are getting together on this same stage, let's say in 2032, 10 years from now, uh, what would you be the most proud of uh, for some of the achievement that is related to biotech and it's related to your, your, your national or your, the, maybe some global uh, initiatives that we all undertook? Could, could you, Mr. Scano, could you? Oh, for me. Uh, um, yeah. I, I, I link it to something that I've not addressed earlier. When you asked me what would be the biggest biotech innovation that will make a difference in the world. 
And, uh, uh, and I think that there is not one specific one. And I bring my experience from China, where I lived for 12 years, and where I've seen the impact of uh, innovation on the life of the individuals. What I think is really important is at the platforms, at the platforms that make a difference, and is to bring platforms to the country, and that's what we are doing with the messenger RNA. The scope might be limited because it's for vaccine, but if you have the environment that is the biocenter and, and the research, you can have application for cancer treatment. So it's not very much the one individual innovation that might, if you get a patent might make the researcher rich or, or the government very well known. It's about creating the environment to exploit the platforms and to make the dots between the platforms. So if you ask me between now and 10 years, that it's a very long uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, view, 10 years uh, from now, is that I hope that that shape will fly and not just float. And, and, and to fly, you need a system that is really to make out of the dots something. And, and that something is, is the future of Serbia that we are happy to support as a WHO. Uh. Mr. Belho, same may, question. Maybe the same question. Maybe I was thinking, I don't know, we are too advanced in this metaverse thing. Yeah. You have done so many things around that and yeah. the assembly, the, met, the first global meta, met, yes. metaverse yes. assembly yes. Uh, was held last week, I guess, yes. In, yes. in Dubai. So maybe, I don't know, I, I'm just thinking some, let's say, uh, application of, of metaverse, so we uh, improve but the biotech yes, industry? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> and I'll uh, come to the metaverse component, but I totally <laughs> agree with the comments, and I think in the years you've mentioned, we will uh, definitely be far more advanced in biotech. We will surely be more, uh, I think we'll be very mature in those 10 years when it comes to telemedicine specifically, because this is mm. uh, emerging significantly. I think we'll be relatively mature when it comes to robotics and, and, and procedures, which I think will be uh, uh, also relatively mature, even though telemedicine, I believe, will be pretty advanced by that time. Going back to cancer and Alzheimer's, I'll maybe steal a few quotes from uh, experts from our future forum. Micho Kako, uh, one of the well-known futurists as well, uh, predicts that um, the quantum compute and the advancement of technology will enable us by this time to really not eliminate cancer, but it will not become the issue it is now because of how advanced technology it is to really predict it and diagnose it at such an early stage where it doesn't become an issue anymore and to his courts, treating it like a cold or a flu at such an early stage. And obviously this evolves to Alzheimer's as well. So his message was that the advancement of quantum compute and technology will enable that component. So those are the, the good signs of, of advancement of technology. But again, in order for all this to happen, we need to go back. If you ask me what is my ultimate dream when it comes to uh, that time of what needs to be achieved, it's beyond biotechnology. It's the unity and alignment uh, as a globe to, to achieve uh, global agendas and priorities in a way that we can create a better future for everyone. And of course, technology and data protection and harmonization. And that's why I re-emphasize on the important on those nodes. And we mentioned the nodes, i.e. the center of fourth industrial revolution to kickstart that mindset. And most importantly is the mindset of the people responsible uh, of, of those responsibilities. You can have the most ambitious plans, but if you don't have the most ambitious people with the right mindset, those plans cannot be achieved. And that's why we're extremely proud with the leadership here in, in, in Serbia. And we've had an amazing uh, conversation as well with the minister as well in, in, in Rwanda as well, and a great conversation with you yesterday as well. And Minister Paula has been a main driver as well and a very like-minded individual. But going back to your comment on the, on the metaverse, um, I'll be very frank, I've witnessed uh, some metaverse experiences. I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I went to the summer version of Davos this year and they had a, a metaverse experience in partnership with Accenture. Um, it's scary good, I'll say, in a way where you get uh, used to it very fast, the moment you wear the... And this is even 
not even scratching the surface when it comes to interacting with people. The value people quoted to five trillion to ten trillion dollars global uh, economy with, by 2030. So the, the value of that it's inevitable. Uh, the, the pros is that the human being has always adapted to advancement of technologies, and we've always done that. Whether it was through the invention of the aircrafts, if you've asked, we always say if you've asked human beings 100 years before the invention of aircraft, whether they believe they'll be 30,000 feet above the sky, they'd think we're crazy. And then if you, as you advance, human beings simply are capable to adapt. I strongly believe we will adapt to this advancement, but I really, the message from our side, as much as we're big fans of the metaverse, we look at our kids, we look at the new generation and the screen time they, 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 they live on right now, and that's not even start, that's only gaming. And that's only uh, social media, uh, let alone wearing those goggles and interacting. And you see them being amazing in what they do. And they, uh, I don't get what they're doing, and I, don't, I know they're doing amazingly in it. But then you also see big risks flagging like social skills, like mental skills, mental well-being, physical well-being. Th those kind of things, you need to monitor them at the same time, because the most important asset in the world is the human capital. And how do we preserve the human capital in those times of advanced technology? Extracting value, but at the same time managing our well-being is the uh, perfect recipe. Again, easier said than done. I'm sure. What about you, Mr. Iradukunda? Well, uh, thank you. You asked me to look into the future. I will give it a try. But um, uh, I firmly believe that uh, the vision that the Prime Minister has, you know, shared with us this morning that Serbia has for uh, biotech for the future. I firmly believe this vision is achievable. Uh, having heard from the different achievements that uh, you've been able to, 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 to do. So in the case for Rwanda, I, I feel uh, there's a lot of possibilities because we are laying the right foundations today. Uh, just to share, in June, uh, Rwanda announced uh, or had a groundbreaking for uh, the first vaccine manufacturing in the country and in the region uh, in partnership with BioNTech. And so if I look, try to look in, into uh, 10 years ahead, what I would really hope for is that um, there is real partnership and collaboration with many of you in the room, uh, that in Rwanda where we have almost a blank canvas to solving a lot of the problems that lack you know, enough research, and enough investment into you know, capacity. I would love to uh, challenge you and invite you uh, to be a part of that journey because, as uh, you rightly pointed out throughout your remarks, this cannot happen in isolation. So we, very, we feel very inspired with uh, the vision uh, that is being presented to us in this Biotech Future Forum here in Serbia, and I really hope that uh, 10 years from now, if we come back on this stage, we can celebrate uh, partnerships and advancement that will come from uh, collectively innovating together. And what I can assure you is that as Rwanda, as a country, we're ready to play our part. Thank you. And what would be you the most proud of, Minister? Well, probably the, all the measures that we are taking uh, now, hopefully the, the conditions where our scientists uh, are working, researching, uh, gaining new, new uh, results, new approaches, and uh, also, uh, I think that this Bio4 campus uh, becoming the center for us, but also for, for the region and even, even globally speaking, uh, would be a great uh, reason for, for being proud. And we, we might look uh, to the future also, we, if you look to the past, we had very prominent scientists, we have already changed the world. Uh, we saw the, the photographs of, of uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, Mihailo Pupin, Milutin Milanković. So I, I don't think that we have to be um, pessimistic about it. We should be optimistic. Throughout the history, we did accomplish, accomplish many, many important things. And uh, if, we, if we expect uh, ourselves to be proud, then we have to be more proactive and to, to work even, even more. But I'm sure that even the new government and the new governments, uh, since she has the 10-year scope, will, of course, achieve the things that we will be proud of. 
We need partners to achieve this vision. So thank you for being here for us, and we hope that an excellent collaboration will come out of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting discussion. discussion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a break until 11.30 when two parallel sessions will be held in two different halls to the left and the right to this main hall. In Nikola Tesla Conference Hall, the panel will be focused on the best practices and approaches in supporting local biotech ecosystems and hear the respective perspectives of five centers for fourth industrial revolution from all around the world. And the panel in Mikhailo Pupin Conference Hall will be focused on data science and biotechnology. So we will hear that sessions and also continue at 11.30. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the break. Uh, now we will continue with the program. We will now hear the, an inspiring talk by Professor George Church, founding core faculty and lead of synthetic biology at the Weiss Institute at Harvard University, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and professor of health science and technology at Harvard and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Mr. Church is also director of the National Institute of Health Center of Excellence in Genomics Science. The session will be moderated by Dr. Jelena Begovic, director of Serbian Institute for Molecular Genetics and Genetic Engineer. Dr. Begovic, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, it's really great pleasure to have you all here today on this amazing event. And I have immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Church. I would like to add few things about him because I think it's important. He's a geneticist, molecular engineer, chemist, but also entrepreneur. So through his Harvard lab, he co-founded co uh, 50 startups, 50 spin-offs, and even during 2018, I mean, he made a record, spinning off 16 biotech companies in one year. Amazing. And he's putting together developmental biology, neurobiology, diagnostics, chemistry, and he really contributed to Human Genome Project, but also he developed the he was one of the developers, I may say, of next generation sequencing, and he sequenced the first bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, you know, the one who, which causes a lot of problems to us. In 2017, Time Magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And in 2020, Fierce Pharma, he announced that he's one of the top famous, eight famous geneticists of all time. And now we are going to talk about biotech and synthetic biology. And this will come from the person who is definitely shaping our future and has, whose work has an immense influence on our everyday lives. So welcome to our conference and thank you for finding time to join us today. I will give you now the floor and uh, let the audience enjoy your lecture. Thank, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'll share my slides here um, and there will be time for, I, I think someone's going to be asking questions uh, soon. So um, I, I'm, I call this the near future biotechnology because a lot of these technologies seem to arrive ahead of schedule. My conflict of interest is in the lower right uh, web page, and I and I and this slide, among many others, there are uh, thank yous uh, to various agencies and people that have helped um, bring these technologies uh, into the into the world for positive social impact. So the near future of biotechnology is uh, five 
quick topics. Uh, one is the increasing use of gene therapeutics for vaccines and aging reversal um, in animals as well as humans. Um, molecular recorders, miniature hybrid or purely biological recording devices, um, use of machine learning for engineering proteins, resistance to all viruses. We finally have a way uh, after a couple of decades to, to uh, make an organism resistant to all viruses, even uh, uncharacterized ones. And then finally, uh, multiplex editing of germline for uh, organs and ecosystems. So we have these exponential curves that I think surprise many people for both reading and writing DNA um, faster than Moore's law for computers. And I think it's due to multiplexing, not to parallelization or automation, but mainly to multiplexing where you mix barcoded samples. More of that, more about that later. In addition to those two exponential cost curves, we're a 20 million fold reduction in price. Here's an example of maybe 1 million fold reduction in price, depending on market size. Here, uh, the most expensive drugs in the world are gene therapies for rare diseases, up to $2.8 million a dose now. Um, and, but then um, five of the top five, all five of the top five uh, vaccines for uh, COVID-19 were uh, formulated in a way like gene therapies. Two of them were, were uh, lipid nanoparticles and three of them were uh, adenoviral vectors, um, bringing the price down to $2 a dose. And I think we can project that forward to other um, large markets, um, not rare diseases necessarily, but large markets. And, and the largest market of all, even bigger than the pandemic, is uh, aging. It'll kill about 90% of us, at least those uh, as, as uh, um, industrialized nations. Uh, so this is another large market with low cost case. Um, we, by multiplex uh, gene editing, sorry, gene therapy, uh, we mean two or three or maybe more genes. So for example, these three on the left uh, that we that were had to feature of being released into the bloodstream. So it's like young blood. Um, and then testing, not just by biomarkers, but by uh, multiple diseases that are only related by having aging as a common cause. So we're not trying to get special case for aging as a disease, but using the standard uh, FDA approval process for uh, a variety of, of diseases. There are 10 uh, hallmarks of aging. I've added cancer here. Uh, and, and my ex postdoc, Pedro de Magalas, uh, established this data database while he was a postdoc and has maintained it uh, ever since. Noah Davidson was a postdoc, now um, co founder of Rejuvenate Bio, co author of um, um, these four papers on using AAV to deliver um, these kind of multiple genes simultaneously first for mice, then now for dogs, and soon for human clinical trials. Um, we also have um, micro devices, which can be either purely biological or hybrid uh, with integrated circuits in biology. We think that these are moving towards being ubiquitous and affordable. Um, here are three different ways of doing nanopore sequencing, uh, which now have just moved from a considered unlikely to being one of the main ways of getting long reads. Um, and then different from nanopores, but somewhat related in the single molecule um, uh, measurement with uh, conductance uh, altered or, um, is uh, molecular transistors. He's, we just published this paper of PNAS with Roswell um, um, showing that molecular transistors have finally gone from a very academic thing to something that can be mass produced with thousands, uh, tens of thousands, maybe someday billions of, of um, molecular transistors on a chip, uh, less than the size of a coin. And here's some of the raw data. Now, transitioning from these hybrid devices with integrated circuits and, and single molecules, we have a way of doing storage of data uh, entirely biologically, you, you, where you tend to store a lot of data, but but in infrequently read it. 
analogous to a flight recorder in an airplane where you 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 store a lot of data, but you only read it if the airplane crashes, which hopefully is rare. Um, we sometimes call this molecular recording or molecular ticker tape. Um, we, we started this in 2002, and now there, there are uh, dozens of, of laboratories around the world working in, in a lovely uh, community. Uh, just one example of this just to, uh, is the... Um, uh, was published by Reza Kolhar, now at Johns Hopkins University, and Prashant Malan Ali, who was uh, one of the co-inventors of CRISPR, who worked with us on this from uh, UC San Diego. Um, uh, these, uh, and and then the Loveless uh, uh, paper from UC Irvine, not from our, our group, showed that you could extend it to uh, physiological measurements of hypoxia or a, or a small molecule like DMOG. The basic idea is to make the textbook CRISPR on the left into this weird CRISPR that cleaves its own guide RNA gene and keeps evolving, does uh, genome vandalism and generates kind of random sequences. And so the guide RNA keeps keeps changing. And there are about 60 of these guide RNAs scattered to the genome. Um, and this should be a worst case scenario for, for off target and things like that. But it turns out that off targets aren't uh, yet proven to be very uh, significant, as, for example, in this experiment. Um, so we estimate that in, in a 30 gram mouse body, we're storing about two terabytes of data in one billionth of the, the size, small tax for that storage. And we're, gonna, we're trying to scale up to 20 petabytes. So terabytes is 10 to the 12th, petabytes is 10 to the 15th um, bytes. Um, so about a 10,000 fold increase uh, by going into the repetitive elements, the sometimes junk DNA or dark matter of the genome, lines, signs, and centromeres. And we're well along with that and published uh, some examples. So this is recording um, the physiological and developmental data. And if you consider one kind of physiology is um, is visual, uh, auditory, and chemosensory, um, each cell is essentially recording the number of photons hitting it. And th at that time series record of the physiology can be turned into um, a, a DNA linear uh, readout um, than, than as, as, we, as we showed for the, um, uh, in the past slide, um, then you could have uh, these uh, devices, which are essentially almost free biomanufacturing because you, you know growing flies is pretty inexpensive. Um, and and they can be highly mobile, very tiny, and and still record a lot of uh, audiovisual data. Now, part of this revolution, in addition to lowering costs and, and through radical things like I've just described, um, has been the steady improvement in our uh, computational biology for synthetic biology, and this, uh, in particular, machine learning or artificial intelligence, machine learning plus mega libraries with millions of designed uh, DNA, RNA, and protein um, constructs, um, which we call MLML for machine learning and mega libraries. We've, we've published eight papers on this recently and spun off four companies, NABLA, focusing on design of antibodies, manifold bio on being able to multiplex uh, protein therapeutics, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of them simultaneously per animal um, during preclinical trials. And then um, dyno therapeutics for delivery via viral capsules that are engineered by machine learning. And finally, patch biosciences for um, cis-regulatory elements, DNA and RNA cis-regulatory elements. So here's a quick example where we can do this MLML on uh, tissue specificity and immune evasion uh, uh, for viral delivery. Uh, Pierce and Eric uh, published these in Science and Nature biotech papers. And um, the, the bottom line for, for one of these is, is that you can now, we tried to change 28 amino contiguous amino acids to see how much we could change. Typically, if you use a, a naive model or no model, uh, 
we get um, we have trouble getting more than two or three mutations before it kills um, the protein completely. So you can see this very low yield in the lower left hand corner of you know large numbers of experiments making small numbers of mutations. But if we use uh, our best log logistic regression uh, neural uh, or, or or neural nets uh, machine learning, we can easily get. 25, 26, or more, still staying above 50% of this huge library being successful. Um, so we can get 28 out of 20 amino acids changed and still have a viable protein. We also have, we can implement this sort of change with alternatives to CRISPR. Um, so these are, in contrast to most CRISPR cutting, uh, these are multiplex, they're precise, and they can be very large edits uh, at the largest is at the genomic scale. So this involves megasynthesis, recombinases, and integrases. Um, here's some examples of recombinases and integrases. We recently um, showed that the SSAPs, which were restricted to E. coli, are now, oh, are now working in a variety of systems, including other microbes, um, plants, and animals, thanks to Gabe, Tim, um, Kale, Tina, and Ben. Uh, We've, we've aimed for, um, since at least 2009, for multivirus resistance, um, non-standard amino acids, and biocontainment. Um, spun off one company so far in this, uh, using these uh, engineered, these highly engineered strains, where we've changed like one of the 64 codons genome-wide. Grove Biosciences um, makes uh, pharmaceuticals with, with uh, altered uh, half-lives and serum and stability. But that, but I think the key one is the, the thing I find very intellectually and practically interesting is um, this idea of making cells that are resistant to all viruses. Um, this is um, uh, Dan Mandel formed Gross Pro Biosciences, and uh, and and all of these authors have been um, instrumental. But I'll tell you. A big breakthrough we have just recently that's only in preprint form so far. So this is hot off the presses. Um, this it, it, it helps with all three forms of biocontainment. You have this dividing cell. You want to make sure that it doesn't take over its environment uh, unless you want it to. You want to be in control of that, and uh, you want it to not exchange DNA or RNA with the environment. You, you don't want it to get in functionally or get out functionally. And if it, if it is isolated in that manner, it's now resistant to all viruses and other mobile elements, and therefore it might be an advantage over the wild organisms, which is very rare. Usually lab organisms are not at an advantage. And if so, we wanna make sure that it's biocontained. Um, so we do this by changing the genetic code. We've changed one of the 64 codons initially. It was resistant to five out of seven viral types. Um, um, established in 2013, 2016, confirmed in 2021. Um, but then wasn't resistant to every single virus. Uh, and to do that, we had to do uh, another bit of, not just change one codon, not just change three codons uh, so that they're eliminated, they've been moved around so the host is not affected, but the incoming virus is. But we had to do a, a codon swap where we took two of the six serine codons, changed them so they encode leucine, um, and we had to do this with a powerful uh, phage transfer RNA gene, um, genes plural, and and you can see just like in the previous one where we're dropping from ten to the twelfth to zero um, plaque forming units per mil. A similar thing is happening now in in this setting. And, we, and we, to make sure it was resistant to every virus we could uh, get our hands on, we collected a, a lot of new raw uh, samples from sewage and farms and so forth. And, um, and all of these in, in various mixtures uh, were um, uh, unable to infect these cells by our most sensitive assays. Now, speaking of, of replication, here's the new winner for re exponential replication relative to E. coli. Um, this is the Vibrio nitrogens, which we're turning into a kind of a replacement for E. coli because of its high 
growth rate. And we're interested in this kind of organism for providing uh, alternatives to, to food where we can uh, escape from supply chain issues um, and have much more compact and uh, affordable food production. So this, this organism, Vibrio, is twice as fast as E. coli. Uh, we have some very fast photosynthetic uh, organisms at 90 minute doubling time and compare that to corn, which effectively has a biomass doubling or seed doubling of, of 17,000 uh, minutes versus 90 for these um, various um, um, pro and eukaryote microbes. We can also engineer the germline, not of humans, but of, of animals, and it can make it into humans by, uh, by transplants. Uh, our, our record so far is 42 uh, germline edits to pigs. That once they're once they're uh, in the, solidly in the germline, then they can breed like pigs, and you no longer have to do the editing and cloning. They just uh, keep um, stably reproducing. We collected um, all of the you know the wish lists that had been accumulating since 1963 when the first successful xenotransplantation occurred, and then uh, implemented these in a number of strains some of which have made it into humans, uh, some of which have survived um, 600 days in preclinical uh, non-human primate trials. Uh, and these trials are occurring at, at um, hospitals like MGH Duke, University of Maryland, and so on. Uh, Lu Han Yang, who's another co-inventor of CRISPR, uh, co-founded Kihan and eGenesis in uh, Hangzhou and Cambridge, Massachusetts, respectively. To, and this is getting moving into clinical trials. And then the final topic I just want to uh, touch upon is using the same kind of tools we use for engineering pigs for transplanting organs um, for other large animals like elephants um, in order to increase biodiversity, to um, rescue endangered species, and to restore ecosystems like the Arctic, um, which uh, has a big carbon sequestration problem. The methane is, is being released as the ice melts. Methane is 80 times worse than carbon dioxide. And so um, the megafauna that uh, were eliminated by our ancestors uh, were necessary for keeping the grass to tree ratio appropriate for high reflectance, high photosynthesis, and packing of snow by the herbivores. The main one needed here is elephants will not, it's the only herbivore that routinely knocks down trees. And, to, and hopefully you're all familiar with how, uh, how many rewildings have been successful, uh, maybe about a thousand worldwide uh, in the last few years, including uh, restoring the wolves to Yellowstone, which had impact on the herbivores and hence the trees, hence the beavers, and hence the, the lakes and, and the fish. So this is an example of a keystone species and elephants are another keystone species that we'd like to move back uh, some of them back north. And um, elephants have a, a problem with a, a herpes virus called EEHV, and pigs have a problem with uh, uh, a, D a D double strand DNA virus called uh, African swine fever virus, which is not restricted to Africa, but is global uh, pandemic. And uh, we just published another preprint on, on how we can reduce the um, um, the, uh, increase the herd immunity, reduce the transmission from one genetically engineered to another gen genetically engineered member uh, uh, of a herd pop of pig population. This is one of the first examples, I think, of using multiple CRISPR guide RNAs to target a double strand DNA virus. Um, well overdue because that's exactly what CRISPR does in the wild, and uh, most of the applications so far have not have been not been of that sort. And finally, uh, we're working on ways of engineering ovarian follicles, um, um, in, in, both in, in, in human and in animals. Uh, and we have two, two preprints on this that I urge you to take a look at if you're interested in that um, as a way of um, improving in vitro fertilization for humans and, and uh, endangered species in, in animals. I've mentioned many collaborators along the way. I just want to mention a few for this last little couple of slides. Uh, Sergey and Nikita Zimov have been wonderful hosts when I visited in Siberia to Pleistocene Park. Um, Stuart and Ryan at Revive and Restore 
helped uh, conspire on on de-extincting genes and on species. And Ben Lamb has really uh, been wonderful at fundraising. Jessica, Ariana, Justin, Margot, Bobby were all early believers in this when we didn't have funding. Uh, and uh, that's it. This is this is where we've been. Um, and period, full stop. Thank you. Questions, maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much for this overview of what is happening uh, on biotech in biotech field on the, the global level, I may say. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, I mean, so far during the history of humankind, we as humans, we, we were like part of the nature and let's say more or less uh, under the influence of laws of the nature, including evolution. We did intervene in the nature, but not in this way. So now, what happens with the evolution? Are we becoming the force of evolution thanks to the technology and the things that we're changing? For instance, the artificial chromosomes, I know that you're working on them, uh, then putting them back into bacteria and creating something new, something that is not connected with the past, where we are going with this. Well, even the most radical, uh, yes, a really, really good point, but even the most radical uh, genome design we have so far is still connected to the past through information, maybe not through direct molecular lineage. Uh, you know, for example, the E. coli I showed you was completely synthesized from scratch. I think it's the largest completely synthetic uh, genome so far, although yeast is coming along uh, rapidly. Um, it is uh, different from any previous species it, since it doesn't exchange uh, information to or from the environment. Um, that's been one of the criteria for a species is, is exchanging information either sexually or horizontal gene transfer. So this would make it a new species, a new genus, all the way up to a, a new kingdom. So it just doesn't exchange uh, information, if that's your definition of new. Um, uh, I, I, but I should say, we've been doing this for quite a while. I, I mean, one of my favorite examples is smallpox, which we've made extinct very intentionally. And we did it at a time where we had almost no understanding of what was going on in smallpox. We didn't know what a virus was, and we didn't know what uh, was happening in in the immune system at a at a cellular or molecular level. So uh, I think we're and I and all all of the rewilding events, as far as I know, have been pretty successful. Um, putting in the past um, unsuccessful things like introduction of cane toads and um, accidental introduction of various uh, um, invertebrates. Um, plants and so forth. I think we're entering a new era where the rewilding efforts are, are um, more thoughtful and, um, um, and, and well regulated by the FDA, the USDA, the EPA, and, and various uh, um, um, global equivalents. And one more question related to, because it's very, very important for us, it's uh, concerns let's say personalized medicine. How far do you think we're going towards really personal medicine and the personalized drug development? Will we go to the individual level and how fast do you see that this can happen? Well, I think we're both uh, simultaneously going to more radical personalization and um, and, and exploiting the generics. So, so I think uh, you know the the examples I gave for vaccines and age uh, aging reversal drugs um, were had the advantage of being very low cost and very impactful uh, potentially on on the whole population um, without being personalized necessarily. But we should but we will add into that you know the rare case where someone might have um, you know, a negative consequence that you can test for with uh, personalized assays. I think we will also pers maybe have personal monitors that will allow us to see the first 
you know, emerging of a new pathogen. Um, so it, be, it, be, it could become much more than personal, but it starts as patient zero. And maybe that's a, an advantage to the personalized uh, mechanism. We can probably cut down the cost of clinical trials and the, the risk um, by, by being able to catch these rare events and being, being able to share these um, handheld or wearable devices, just being able to share the information could be uh, you know, equivalent of a, a, a bio-weather map uh, for the sort of things that could um, affect many of us. So, I, I mean, I think we're going in both directions, both towards highly personalized and um, pre precision medicine and um, generic medicines. Okay, and one last question, because I know that you're working on, uh, not only you, on longevity. Uh, so how are we going to cope? I mean, if we live, for instance, 150 years, what is ahead of us? Yeah. I mean, a lot of question. challenges. Good question, but clarification. Uh, we're not really trying, we're not working directly on longevity because the clinical trials for longevity are too long. Um, we're working on aging reversal because, okay. you know, uh, I mean, it's just a practical aspect of getting uh, approval, um, safety and, and efficacy. Uh, so aging, you know, aging reversal in principle, you can see effects uh, on age, aging diseases um, in weeks rather than in decades. So that's a, a practical component. The other thing is we're not really looking for lunch, even if longevity is a, is a side product. We are aiming for healthy, youthful uh, mind and body, and that um, that's a very that's so being 150 and feeling like and acting and working like you're in your 20s uh, would be uh, highly desirable. Uh, possible side effect of a aging reversal drugs aimed at serious um, diseases. Uh, what the consequence of that for the population, um, just to speculate, since you're asking, uh, it, it, we have act, um, a, a reduction in fecundity of of of, pop, of the family size as a function of moving into the cities. We're we're moving towards eighty plus percent in in the cities, um, and that results in a, in a change in family size from say seven per family to uh, one point two, meaning much less than replacement level. Also, there, if we are successful at reducing the, the cost of getting off the planet, which is a good backup plan, uh, some of us may do what, what was done in the you know, 1700s in immigrating to, uh, to America and other uh, 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 new worlds. So, um, so we might, might need uh, more people. Um, Ironically, and and also if we get more efficient in producing food, and I mentioned ways that we might get a hundred times more efficient, then there might be an opportunity of restoring uh, a lot of the world to to um, uh, to a wild state and still having more people supported um, comfortably. But that's very speculative. So we will need another planet just for a backup, I think. <laughs> I Thank you very much once again, and I hope we will see you next uh, year here in person in Belgrade. Uh, I would really love to have you here with our, within our ecosystem and to show you what we are doing and what we are planning to do. So one more time, thank you very much for your presence thank you. today. Thank you very much. And from, from me also, thank you very much, Dr. Begovic, and uh, thank, uh, many thanks to Dr. Church for this very interesting session. Um, we'll now move on the another round of parallel session in the halls to the left and the right of this main hall. The session in the Mikhailo Pupin conference hall will focus on the business perspective when it comes to accelerating innovation, while in the Nikola Tesla conference hall, the panel will discuss how academia is shaping our biotech future. After the parallel sessions, we'll uh, 
reconvene in this hall for the presentation of the Bio4 campus and the last note. Once again, please be aware that besides the panel halls, you can also listen to the panels in the here main conference hall by using provided headsets. Thank you. Biotechnology will define our future and we'll know here we'll now hear how Serbia is preparing for this future. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nenad Paunovic, director of the IT and an entrepreneurship team in the office of the Prime Minister of Serbia, and Dr. Jelena Begovic, director of the Institute of Molecular Genetics and Genetic Engineering will present Serbia's vision for establishing a world-renowned center for research and development in the fields of biomedicine, bioinformatics, biotechnology, and biodiversity. Mr. Paunovic, Dr. Begovic, you have the floor. Please. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I believe we will have a nice presentation as well. Okay, fantastic. Uh, in the next 20 or so minutes, you're going to talk about why we believe that Serbia is going to be the new bioeconomy hub in Europe and why we are doing what we are doing. There is a fantastic quote in the book, Steve Jobs from Walter Isaacson, about uh, the future, basically. It says, I think the biggest innovation of the 21st century will be the intersection of biology and technology. A new era is beginning just like the digital one. As the Prime Minister said this morning, we can't actually claim that this is the fifth industrial revolution, but it does certainly look like this to us. And what is more important, Mr. Harari says that the future is already here. This is not something we are talking that is going to come and be in the future. This is something that we are already living. Serbia does recognize this new revolutionary potential in convergence between biology and technology, and we do believe that it is going to be in at least four key areas of life. Key areas because they are super important and super expensive. We are talking about medicine, with biomedicine, monoclonal antibodies, mRNA vaccines, and all those fancy terms that us non-biologic people and non-medicine people learned during the COVID-19 pandemic. These are the technologies more than a decade old, but only now they are entering mainstream and they're entering our ordinary lives. There is going to be a revolution in medicine, make no mistake about that. There is also going to be a revolution in agriculture, food production, precision farming, precision feeding, and all those things that are happening right now. There is going to be a, a revolution in energy as well on JITEX, fair for, for technology. In Dubai last year, we've seen that out of top 20 innovations, around three or four were about plant-based batteries. So new kind of energy sourcing are emerging. And last but not least, environmental protection and sustainability. And I've talked to people who says that the custom-made bacteria is what is going to clean the earth more and uh, faster than anything else. This new revolution, is driven by new technologic advancements, like for instance, synthetic biology. And this is the actual homepage of an actual company that is claiming that they are creating organisms by design with functions and features ordered by their clients. They can program cells. And once you can program cells and biology, sky's the limit. And as one of our colleagues says, it's half super, half scary. But it's not just about technology, it is that it's becoming mainstream. This is the newsletter that I received. This is actually my screenshot from, from my laptop that I received on 14th of February this year. BCG's Boston Consulting Group, one of the largest and most renowned consulting companies in the world. And they said the newsletter with the main headline that synthetic biology is coming to disrupt an industry near you which to a businessman like myself means it is here, it is mainstream, be aware of that. <clears throat> McKinsey, uh, as all good consultants, want to put a number on it. So they did a biorevolution report back in 2020. And they said 
that this bio-revolution, as they call it, is going to be worth between two and four trillion dollars annually from products and services that we can envision right now. This is without breakthrough innovation, without disruptive technologies, just from what we can see from today's perspective, which means it is financially and monetary huge. Serbia now want to build on our ICT success, and the Prime Minister this morning talked about how successful our, our IT is and how important it is to Serbian economy, but we want to go the step further. We want to be the creative part of this fifth industrial revolution. We want to be one of the R&D and IP creation places of the world, and we want to be an equal partner in that process. We are therefore creating a bioeconomy hub, and we want to be one of the renowned and recognized hubs in at least Europe, if not the world, and we call it Bio4 Campus. We see it as a really unique concentration of people, talent, and infrastructure that is going to be an important place of creation of products and solutions that are going to be used in those areas that I already mentioned. Why Bio4 Campus? Bio4, to us, is biomedicine, biotechnology, bioinformatics, and biodiversity. These are the areas that we see as key and super important to our bio revolution and our bio future. Bio4 campus, and these slides, I see a lot of people taking pictures, these slides are available at bio4.rs. This is our website. It is an ugly homepage, but then this is, when you click on the link, there is, there is a very nice PDF file with this presentation, even a bit more detailed. But nevertheless, Bio4 campus is going to be built in a traditional life science area of the capital city of Serbia, Belgrade. And it's, it's, go, it's in the area where already we have the Institute for Virology, Vaccines, and Sera, we call Torlak. There is also a pharmaceutical faculty of University of Belgrade. There is also Institute for Molecular Genetics and Genetic Engineering. There is also there our national regulating authority that we call the ALIMS. Over there, on a, we are super lucky to have almost eight hectares of basically empty piece of land. Over there, we are going to build our Bio4 campus. This is going to be a home to a multidisciplinary set of tenants. It's going to create an ideal ecosystem of innovation from many different ang angles. We are going to have there nine scientific institutes. And for some of you that hear this presentation multiple times, you can recognize that those numbers over there are rising every time that you hear the presentation. So up until a few days, we had eight scientific institutes. Now, another fantastic one joined the team. So we have nine scientific institutes five faculties from the University of Belgrade, convention and multimedia museum, and also big conventional center for people to get around, share ideas, for them to mingle. This is why we call it Minglarium. There are also going to be a business park with R&D centers of so pharmaceutical, biotech, life science, and other companies, both multinational, global, but also our. Serbian, so we, and there's also going to be an extension of Science Technology Park in Belgrade, specifically done for biomedicine and biotech startups. So we are going to put together the education, the science, large corporation, and startups, of course, permeated with a set of investors. They, we are also going to have an accredited animal facility and several other core centers and uh, core technology. All of this is going to happen in a beautiful architectural environment. And while you're enjoying this picture, I will kindly ask Dr. Jelena Begovic to take over from here and tell you a bit more about our tenants, who's going to be there, and about the science they're going to do there. Thank you. I have to make Jelena. a comment. I mean, the first huge success of today's meeting is that this room is still full of people. I'm really amazed. And uh, different stakeholders from different, you know, areas of uh, everyday lives are still here. And uh, then uh, IT guys and investment bankers and the government is talking about biotech. I think this is a huge success. So I will uh, just explain to you a little bit. Um, so 
this is the part of the faculties, and then here we will have scientific institutes. So, so far, we will have a complete faculty of pharmacy and biology moved within the new facilities, new laboratories, new centers. Then we will have a part of agriculture, a fa faculty of agriculture, translation center of the faculty of medicine, and uh, tissue engineering, bioengineering, and chemical engineering from faculty of technology and metallurgy. So let's say this is at least part of the, our eco scientific ecosystem that it's involved in biotech, and they will be on one place within the campus. Then we have so far nine scientific institutes. Some of them will move completely. Some of them will move just with some centers. So we want really to put together people that are motivated to develop our technology, but not only to develop, to do the technology transfer, to do the knowledge transfer. So really to put the scientific research in concrete products and concrete processes. Uh, we have different institutes uh, from genetical engineering, but also artificial intelligence. We have biosense, we have medical research, multidisciplinary research. We have, uh, let's say, a pipeline for biobank of natural products from uh, Institute Sinisha Stankovic, but also the Institute of Cardiovascular Medicine, the Institute of Appliance of Nuclear Energy, and Institute of Chemistry, Technology, and Metallurgy. But we're all, let's say, focused around one task, to develop biotechnology and to innovate and to open the whole eco scientific ecosystem so we can give a chance to our young, amazing scientists, amazing students, to create something new in Serbia. Uh, then uh, we will have, as you heard, the extension of science, te science technology park, but nevertheless, within this facility, we will also have a center for ideas. So centers for students so they can play science. I say play, uh, but really, whether they will transfer it to the startup or whether they will transfer it to some uh, excellent research, it will be their decision. Uh, up to us is how to create them the ecosystem so they can really give their best within this uh, center. Minglarium. So this building, we will all meet here. So the private sector, the startup community, the academia, and public also because we're planning to have a multimedia museum because it's very important, I would rather say now crucial, to really have a good open communication, two-way communication with public. When we talk about biotech, it's very, very important. So we will meet here on regular basis and on a voluntarily basis, which is very important. So this is how it's going to look like from different perspectives. We will also have accredited animal facility. It's somewhere where it's, you know, there is no noise and no, no uh, vibrations for preclinical trials. So from different perspectives, we want to create really uh, amazing environment because we're moving some of the stakeholders from the city center, uh, from their zones of comforts. We want to give them sports centers. We want to give them places where they can relax, where they can enjoy, where they can live, because we will have also accommodation for students and hotel as a support for conferencing center that will uh, be situated within this minglarium. So this is going to be the place, whether it's winter, whether it's summer, of people to meet and really enjoy a unique unique ecosystem. I mean, they really deserve it. And the idea is that this uh, ecosystem lives not only from 9 to 5, but that lives 24 hours a day, so every single person can, you know, find its slot, time slot, to spend time here from different reasons.
So we, <clears throat> no, I will give this to you. Okay. <laughs> you need the, this here. So basically when we looked, looked at it, we always want to, to see who is doing this uh, the best in the world. And we looked at the relevant exam examples of other campuses around the world. This is the list you can see. Important thing is that most of those people we already know. We have met them, we have discussed our Bio4 campus with them on a different levels, and with a few of them, during, uh, within the next couple of months, we are going to have MOUs and a very formal cooperation. So we are very, very proud on the feedback that we got about, uh, for our Bio4 campus from the best in the world. We are now really so happy and so proud and, and so confident, to be honest, that we can discuss bio-revolution with the world's Premier League. This is something that is, that is now becoming a new norm for us. This is something that requires us to raise our ambition to the highest possible level, to be on that level of our game, and to try to be, cooperate, collaborate, and compete with the best in the world. Ultimate goal is what happened actually in Cambridge. This is the example we particularly like. And this is that one of the, of course, uh, most prominent pharma companies in the world, AstraZeneca, they moved its headquarters a couple of years ago from London to Cambridge campus to be in the campus, to be among the students, researchers, scientists, among ideas and innovations. And this ecosystem of innovations is what we are creating now with our Bio4 campus. And the thing that makes me particularly happy and proud is that this kind of interest is already visible with our Bio4 campus with companies, large and small, that we are already discussing with. Work of, uh, on Bio4 campus has already begun. Last year, in 2021, we've done a couple of things. The government approved this project. We opened the, sec uh, the Center for Genome Sequencing and Bioinformatics within the IMGGI. We acquired a supercomputer of later generation from NVIDIA, put it in the state-owned data center, which is also state-of-the-art. We have an AI platform. So we do have kind of an infrastructure requirements to already start working. <clears throat> this year, and better part of next year, we are going to do the design, to do the projects, and to get prepared by, uh, in Q3, basically we are going to start building. From Q3 next year, within the next year and a half or two years, we are going to build the Bio4 campus, and we expect in mid-2025 for it to be completed and to put tenants inside. But Bio4 Campus being an infrastructure project is just one facet of the story. What emerged as a very important other hand is that it is also a platform for communication, collaboration, and doing things together. Because we, we are so lucky that the Bio4 Campus that we are building with 15 or so tenants already, scientific and educational tenants, it is not a greenfield invest, investment from the scientific point. All of those faculties, all of those institutes, they already exist, they are operational. They have their projects, they have their research. So you can already start cooperating with them on a bilateral project, trilateral projects, consortium, so you can do research, business together, even now. And what we are doing, we are working very intensely on the business capacities of those scientific institutes in order to make them up to the point where they can discuss serious projects with some of the best global pharma and life science companies. This is the work we need to do, this is something we are doing, but we do expect that when we open a Bio4 campus in 2025, it will not be an open, empty space, it will be just launched in full speed. When the rubber meets the road, it's going to be really in full speed. And this is the process that is happening during the next, it already started this year, this whole year it's ongoing, but for the next two or three years, we are going to work super intensely with all stakeholders, all uh, multidisciplinary tenants of our campus to create the ecosystem of innovation in biomedicine and biotechnology, to educate and find investors, to work with multinational companies, with life science companies, with big pharma, to make their very, very top managements aware there is this new thing 
in Europe called Bio4 Campus and for them to be interested in cooperating and working with us. We do believe we have a very, very strong value proposition for them because we do have access to skill, talent, cutting edge infrastructure and strong government support, among other things. We are one of the rare places, and it will not last for long, that we have very good science, very good talent, but not a very good saturation on the demand side yet. And this is where the first movement uh, mover advantage can happen. I, I, I've seen this because I've been in the IT ecosystem for the last 15 or so years. This is something that happened then when we had available IT talent and everyone, everyone uh, was growing, doing outsourcing, etc. But right now our IT, IT ecosystem is very saturated. It is very successful. It is still fast growing, but is nowhere, nowhere near in talent availability for what it was a dozen years ago. Now this is the situation with biology. You can find talent, but uh, who moves first will have the, the, the greatest benefit. There is also access to best students, access to startups, and there will be a very good integration with the medical system because this is really uh, done by the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister herself is the big champion of this project. On cutting edge infrastructure, we do have a comprehensive research infrastructure, access to facilities, accredited vivarium, and a lot of other equipment that I can't even pronounce. And there is also strong government support. We did have amend our IP governing laws a few years ago, so they are now on par to anything in the most developed countries in Europe. We do have fantastic tax incentives, very generous, supporting value-based tax incentives, supporting IP creation, research and development activities. And it goes not just only for IT, but for any intellectual property and R&D activities. You can also find uh, all of them on our websites. And there is also the government commitment. You've seen this with the Prime Minister herself this morning. You're seeing it from us now. And this is something that we believe are the basic prerequisites with a lot of work that we are willing to put into this within the next couple of years for us to be successful and to create this new bioeconomy hub in Europe that you mentioned at the very beginning. You are all invited to join us in this endeavor. Thank you very much for your attention. And we are here uh, open for business. So whatever we can do together, we'll be more than willing to do so. Thank you very much. I must say, no, thank you very much for this impressive uh, presentation. They are still talking, okay. <laughs> I don't know how you can manage, but congratulations. <laughs> uh, one more applause, please, thank you. Uh, we are at the finish line, uh, almost, for this day. Uh, it's the time uh, has come for the keynote by uh, Dr. George Yankopoulos, co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer of uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and president uh, at uh, Regeneron uh, Research Laboratories. This session will be moderated by Dr. Nevenka Dimitrova, vice president of data science and data services at the GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. Dimitrova, please take the stage. Thank you. Please applaud. Well, thank you, and um, I'm very honored and excited to uh, host this session. So um, it is um, um, one of the most uh, famous scientists um, that really has taken biotechnology from an idea, from a lab, to uh, impacting the lives of so many people around the world. So, um, George Damis Yankopoulos is an MD, PhD. He's a co-founder, president, chief scientific officer of Regeneron. Uh, this is one of the world's premier biotech companies. Last time I checked, it was somewhere in the ballpark of $80 billion. So um, it's, a, it's a big pharma, actually, not only a small biotech where it started 30 years ago. So working alongside longtime partner, um, 
who is the president and CEO, uh, which is Dr. Leonard Schleifer. So imagine two physician scientists starting a company and leading a company uh, based on science. So um, he is the main force behind Regeneron science-driven uh, culture and unique ability to repeatedly, consistently create, translate uh, medicine, science into medicine, leading 10 FDA-approved um, and authorized treatments and many promising in the pipeline. Regeneron is one of the companies that's routinely um, named among the most innovative companies in the world, both by Forbes and the Science Medicine. So Dr. Yankopoulos was among the 10 most highly cited scientists, um, and he was inducted in the National Academy of Sciences in 2004. He has been named in the Biotech Hall of Fame in 2014, has received Ernest Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, has received uh, from, from Forbes 100 Most Innovative Leaders in 2019, and the Heroes of Pandemic in 2020. However, in the context of this conference, what makes Dr. Yankopoulos' keynote very special is that his great-grandfather, Vladan Djordjevic, who was a medical doctor and who was the first formally educated surgeon in Serbia, was actually a mayor of Belgrade, and he went on to become prime minister of Serbia between 1897 and 1900. So, wow, what a family connection. The Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences announced the year 2020 as the year of Vladan Djordjevic. Last year, they held a conference in his name. So, um, his great-grandfather has made a tremendous mark on Serbian history, and this keynote will be both educational and symbolic, as you, as, as you will um, agree, and a great com continuity in the family history, but also in Serbian history. So with this, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jankopoulos. Thank you, Nevenka, for that introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Great. As you said, uh, it's very meaningful for me to be speaking at this conference. It's quite an honor. You've all heard about uh, uh, Vladan Djordjevic, and um, uh, I only wish I could be there in person, and I hope uh, in the very near future uh, I'll be able to visit and, um, and, and, and meet all of you. But today I'm going to be talking, as Nevenka said, about the building of our company, Regeneron, which is now over 30 years ago that uh, we started it with my longtime partner, Len Schleifer. Uh, and before I tell you about what we've done, I just want to give a little perspective upon how difficult it is to actually invent important new medicines. Uh, quantitatively, it's one of the most difficult things, difficult challenges that faces mankind, despite thousands of major academic centers worldwide and thousands of biotech and biopharma companies and millions of researchers and hundreds of billions of dollars spent every year. Um, the FDA um, and, and worldwide approvals only measure in the dozens. Uh, and very few of these are really uh, uh, first in class medicines that really address uh, the biggest diseases that are facing, uh, uh, facing us all. So it's a very, very hard thing that we do, and which is why so few companies actually succeed. The vast majority of companies fail and never even approve one drug. And so our goal was to try to change uh, this and, and to be a rare company that could repeatedly go from an idea to an approved drug to an important drug that can affect many lives over and over and over again. Uh, and that was our goal. 
Um, and um, the one difference really about our company when we really started out, uh, we were perhaps the first biotech company to bet it all on the power of genetics. Initially it was mouse genetics and then it became human genetics. And uh, before I tell you how we did it, as Navenka already indicated, uh, by many criteria, we have done it. Uh, by many outside observers, we are successful. Uh, we now are a very large company with large numbers of people. We have headquarters in Tarrytown, which is just north of New York City. We have manufacturing facilities here in the United States, but also in Ireland. Um, and But we remain the only major public biotech company founded and still run by physician scientists. And I think that that helps explain why we believe we're different, uh, as in that we're the only major biotech company that invents all its new medicines. Over the last 10 years, many have said that we've had perhaps the most productive stretch in biotech history with the invention of 10 FDA approved or authorized medicines. And they all came in-house from our own ideas and our own technologies and our own people. Uh, but I didn't want to give you or leave you with the impression that it was easy. It took us 20 years to get our first drug approval. It took us 25 years to become profitable. And up until then, the financial analysts used to mock us as a definitive example of why you don't want scientists running a business. But then somehow, um, uh, as Len said, we were viewed as an overnight success after 20 years of perceived failure. Um, but really what we were doing over those 20 years was building the foundation for success that have now led to uh, what others have said is one of the most productive and exciting runs in biotech history. And the validation really of everything that we've done in our approach and our people and our ideas is really the, the delivery, the invention and the delivery of many important new uh, medicines uh, from the world's leading medicines to cure blindness, to novel approaches to treat cancer uh, and other diseases, and now even um, uh, the first FDA approved uh, or authorized antibody cocktails to treat Ebola and COVID-19. So this really has demonstrated that our approach really works. Uh, this slide just shows the top 20 drugs worldwide in 2021. And you might notice on this list, three of the, the these uh, top worldwide drugs are uh, from Regeneron. We're the only company on the list that has invented and developed in its own labs, three of the world's leading drugs, ILEA, the world's leading treatment to prevent and treat blindness, RegenCov, the first antibody cocktail treatment for COVID-19, and Dupixent, the world's leading biologic for multiple allergic diseases. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about. And all of this starts with our commitment to what I call relentless innovation, developing transformative genetics-based technologies uh, that we think are the basis and the foundation for ultimately understanding biology, understanding and validating the right drug targets, and then ultimately the technology themselves deliver the actual medicines themselves. Um, and as I said, uh, it started very early on, more than 30 years ago. As I said, we started the company and we bet it all on mouse genetics, which was very early field back then. Um, and in the very early days, we made the first knockout mouse in biotech history. I recruited a friend of mine who, who had made the first knockout in academia, and I brought him to Regeneron to build our mouse genetics capabilities. And back then I said something that people didn't understand. A line, the company that best controls the genome of the most important laboratory animal model, the mouse, will become a leader in the biotech industry. People didn't understand that. People didn't understand, you know, where's the drug there? Um, and what we've proven over the years is if you use mouse genetics, for example, you can knock out, as we did, very large numbers of genes to understand their function, to understand which gene products might make the best drug candidate targets. Uh, and then we actually used these technologies to actually engineer uh, mice that delivering the therapeutics themselves, as I'm gonna explain in a second. Uh, and this just is some of our early work. What we did that really showed the power of our approach, we started looking for rare, what we call X-Men mutants, 
uh, human beings who have special powers or, or, or special susceptibilities. For example, those who might be resistant to pain, the, the individual uh, in, in the picture on the left is a circus performer who doesn't feel pain. He can stick uh, needles and nails right through his body. Um, the, the, the young boy on the right is a super muscular boy. And it turns out that he has a special gene in him that makes him super muscular. So these rare X-Men mutants with superpowers do live amongst us. And what we started doing in the early days was trying to identify the genes that made them special, try to understand the genes and see if we could provide these superpowers via new medicines uh, to people who might actually need them. Uh, so just to show how, how this worked in the early days, we took the gene um, uh, that, that made this boy super muscular. We helped identify it, figure it out, put it into a mouse uh, to prove that we had the right gene. And as you can see, the mouse on the right looks bigger under their fur. That's because that mouse is super muscular. Uh, you have to dissect it to really see it. This is the mouse on the left dissected. You see the arrows point to the normal leg muscles. This is the mouse on the right. So when you take the right gene, you identify it from a human being who has some special genetic capability, you can confer that genetic capability into a mouse and now prove that that pathway, um, you can manipulate it genetically and maybe figure out how to turn um, that genetic capability into an important new medicine that can help people in this case, for example, who might be suffering from weakness and, and loss of muscles. So this is sort of the basis of our approach. Uh, we start with uh, human genetics uh, that reveal a unique strength or susceptibility. Uh, we engineer mice to reproduce this and to teach us more about the biology and the drug target. And then we figure out how to, how to actually create a drug to mimic this. So how do we do that? Well, one of the next technologies that led to a huge pipeline for us of new drugs was we used the same genetics capabilities that we had developed to learn how to manipulate the genes in a mouse to make the mice that I just showed you on the previous slide. But in this case, to make a mouse that had uh, uh, an incredible, what we call genetically humanized immune system. This was the largest genetic engineering project uh, ever undertaken uh, in history, even in the age now of CRISPR. About 2% of this mouse's genome is now human, and the genes that it has encodes for the immune system of the mouse. And why would you want to do this? Well, uh, what we've now proven, and we've actually used it time and again, um, we can challenge this mouse that we made that has a genetically humanized immune system with almost any disease or disease target, and we can get out of that mouse using a variety of related technologies a human antibody medicine. And we've used this now to develop drugs to treat all sorts of diseases from cancer to Ebola. And it all started with an idea that if you could make such a mouse, it could be an incredible delivery vehicle for new medicines. And so indeed, this genetically humanized mice that we developed with these new genetics technologies that we had developed has already yielded many important FDA approved and authorized antibody medicines treating all sorts of diseases from inflammatory diseases to heart disease to cancer, and more recently, even Ebola and COVID-19. I just want to, there's so many stories here. They're great stories. Each one would take um, hours to really go into detail, but I just want to give an example of the, the important medicine in the upper left called dupixent or dupilumab that has really changed uh, uh, the face of allergic diseases. Uh, this one is near and dear to my heart for many reasons. I started working on this in the 1980s in part because people in my family suffered from these diseases. And now the very medicine that I invented, um, my daughter uh, uh, is on this medicine and has totally cured her disease and changed her life. So what, what are the diseases and what is, what is this medicine? It's, a, a, it's, a, it's an antibody that we got by immunizing our velocimmune mouse uh, that yielded a fully human antibody that blocks the IL-14, interleukin-14, and interleukin-13 pathways. And it really seems like a miracle medicine which has become a leading medicine for so many allergic uh, diseases like severe asthma, atopic dermatitis, 
uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and just to show you how life-changing this medicine can be, uh, severe atopic dermatitis, which was one of the allergic skin diseases that, um, that this drug really um, has an amazing effect on, uh, can really ruin children's lives, people's lives, and whole families' lives. This is a story that was sent to us from um, uh, a physician who was in our early clinical trials, but this is very related to the story that I suffered with with my daughter. Uh, this could be my daughter's story. Uh, but the physician who was in our clinical trial sent before and after images of this poor girl whose life was being ruined by this allergic skin condition. Uh, basically, it's like having poison ivy um, uh, covering your body, but um, it never goes away and it covers large portions of your body. You're constantly itching. Uh, you can't sleep. Uh, it, it, it obviously ruins, ruins your life. Um, and so uh, as indicated in the note from the physician treating this patient in our clinical trial, um, uh, it was ruining her life and her family's life. So these are pictures of this poor girl before treatment with Dupixin. These are pictures of her afterwards. And I can tell you, as I said, personal experience, my own daughter, this is a life-changing medicine, can give people um, not only clear, clear skin, uh, and, and not suffering from this horrible condition and the constant itch, uh, but it really gives them their life back and, and you know, changes, changes uh, uh, an entire family's life if you have a child like this. And this is just a highlight. I mean, this is why we do what we do, to try to change lives, to try to improve lives through the power of science, technology, and particularly genetically derived medicines. And, um, this girl's story or my daughter's story, they're not isolated stories. Um, the data uh, in this particular disease across um, multiple now uh, phase three trials, these are the rules rather than the exceptions. Most drugs don't work like this, where you have 70 to 80% average improvement in a disease. But that's what makes Dupixin such a special drug. Uh, it not only addresses so many multiple allergic diseases, but the effects on each of these diseases are, are so dramatic. They're really, uh, in the average patient, almost uh, 70 to 80% eliminating um, um, the disease and disease markers. So that was an example of our philosophy, immune technologies that depended on our ability to make a genetically humanized immune system in a mouse using the power of our mouse genetic technology. So it's all about our genetic space technologies, um, and, and we now actually have modified those mice to make help us make a different kind of antibody, not a conventional antibody. Most antibodies bind, antibodies are Y-shaped at the ends, they have their variable regions. The two variable regions are identical, they bind two identical things. We realized that we could make it, we were the first to put into human clinical trials what are known as bispecific antibodies, antibodies that could bridge two different things. And we had the idea of actually using bispecific antibodies to bridge uh, killer T cells and tumor cells. And the results with these bispecific antibodies are nothing short of um, uh, spectacular. Um, what we were able to do with these, normally when T cells try to attack a target, they need what is known as signal one and signal two. Uh, we've made on the right, as you can see, bispecific antibodies that can actually mimic uh, signal one and signal two. We can give them separately or together. And the results we see in animal studies were really unprecedented where we could combine them and literally clear uh, tumors uh, in mice. So we moved these into the clinic and now we've reported recently some really uh, dramatic um, results that if we can continue to uh, progress these, this could really change the treatment of of cancers. In this particular case, these were last stage terminal prostate cancer patients um, who had been resistant to um, all prior therapies. Uh, on average, they had about six months left to live. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, in 75% uh, of patients treated dramatic, very rapid responses with more than 99% uh, reduction in disease. And now some of the earlier, earliest patients that we've treated with this 
uh, regimen uh, have been more than a year out, completely free of their cancer, not even requiring any further treatment. So these bispecifics really, like many of our other medicines for other diseases, uh, have uh, potential to really change the practice of medicine in the field that they're being applied, in this case, in terminal cancer settings. So um, what I wanted to quickly end with is our latest, and I think one of our greatest uh, developments in terms of genetic-based technologies, uh, what we call our Regeneron Genetic Center and our Regeneron Genetics Medicines capabilities. Uh, many of you probably don't realize that Regeneron is the world's leading human sequencing organization. We sequence more than 2 million humans. Uh, <clears throat> the thing that makes our database so special is not only do we have the most human sequence, but each one of them is linked to detailed electronic health records, which has allowed us to create the largest big data set uh, linking human genetic variation to medical variation, allowing us now to do what I said we started doing 30 years ago, finding gene variation in humans that causes either resistance or susceptibility to disease, but we're now doing it at a very large scale. This has led uh, to uh, um, uh, a very exciting new pipeline, moving us away from antibody-based therapies now to genetic medicines. I don't really have time to get into the details of this, um, uh, I'll briefly flash the next few slides, but two of our most exciting advances uh, and really near-term opportunities that are already either in the clinic or about to go in the clinic showing results in human patients um, that I wanted to highlight is uh, with our Intellia partners, we were the first uh, to, to demonstrate uh, the first example of successful CRISPR-based treatment in humans uh, where we largely ablated a pathological gene. It was the first human trial success of systemic CRISPR-based gene therapy to knock out a pathological gene. And I think that that can really lead to uh, dramatic um, uh, changes in how medicine is done going forward in the future. Uh, and another really exciting technology that we've pioneered is using um, viral vectors to deliver gene therapy in a tissue targeted manner. And particularly what we've done here is we actually use antibodies, bispecific antibodies like I've just shown you, to bind to viruses on one side and the other side binds to whatever cell in the body you want that virus delivered to and that allows us to deliver a viral payload to that specific cell. So uh, this just summarizes the, that first clinical trial for a CRISPR-based gene correction in humans. That was very successful, showing more than 90% reduction in the product of this pathological gene for essentially uh, as long as we then continue to follow the human. This just shows how we can change how viruses work. In this particular case, the normal virus on the top uh, delivers its, its payload to the liver, but then when we change targeting using antibodies, we can now detarget the liver and deliver the genetic payload to muscle or potentially to any, um, any cell in the body that we want. So an exciting new ways that we could be changing um, the practice of medicine by really taking gene medicines, um, uh, taking genetic discoveries and turning them into genes medicines in the same turnkey way that we did it with antibody-like uh, medicines um, uh, and bispecifics and so forth. So um, that's um, pretty much uh, what I wanted to tell you about. It's a, it's a real uh, quick overview of what we've done over the last uh, 30 plus years to get us here. And I, I think the whole point is that it's all about continuing to push the edge, continuing to relentlessly try to innovate to come up with new ideas, new approaches, and in our case, new genetics-based technologies uh, that we can use to uh, change the practice of medicine. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yankopoulos. This is um, really brilliant. Um, thank you for your presentation. And uh, when we talk about Velocimmune, uh, the genetically 
um, humanized um, immune system. Um, that's, that was a very transformative technology that allowed the development of so many medicines. Now, I'm told by my colleagues at Regeneron that you still do hands-on science and you have your Friday science rounds and you dive deeper into the data and to the science. So I'd like to ask you... I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Dimitrova. Sorry. I have to interrupt, and I'm sorry to Dr. Yankopoulos also, but we are at the very end because of a okay. strict agenda. Because we have, we have uh, participants, uh, they see. have to go to Novi Sad from here, and we have okay. buses that wait outside of this building. So we have to short this and say to you, thank you very much, okay. and Dr. Yankopoulos thank you. also. <laughs> thank Please, you one, so one more time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you very much, doctors. And uh, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, also very much for uh, attending to, to this forum. Uh, this forum look like this. Please, it, it's this day. What is time? One day in 30 seconds. Thank you all. Wish you all the best. Thank you uh, to attend this forum. Hope to see you next year. Till then, enjoy, enjoy Belgrade, enjoy Novi Sad, enjoy Serbia. Thank you very much.